first of committee staff. Staff has made an amazing work these days to plan and project this summit. So thank you very much. My name is Daniela Luvero and I am a gynecology oncologist in Italy. And I'm also the chair of the GCS Advocacy Committee alongside my amazing colleague, Rosalind Glasspool, who unfortunately could not join us today. But the amazing IGCS CEO, Mary Aiken, is here to moderate the summit with me. Please, Mary. You are on mute. My apologies. You would think this was my first Zoom, right? Thank you, Danielle. I'm so excited to be here with you today for our annual advocacy summit, especially since it's Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month. It's a big month for our community, and I know many of you have been busy hosting and participating in events and campaigns all throughout the month to help raise awareness and funding for gynecologic cancers. Thank you all for your efforts and all that you've done, and we help each other and support each other through this. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items. We encourage you to keep your video on if possible. We love seeing your faces. We want this to feel as personal and focused on our community as possible, but we understand if that's not possible. We would ask that you keep your microphone muted during the presentations. We may invite you to comment from time to time. The Q&A chat will be open, so please, during the presentation, submit your questions. Danielle and I will be monitoring those closely. We encourage you to submit. For the best view of the slides, we recommend you fit Zoom to the window. And finally, please remember this summit is being recorded. So there's lots of opportunity to watch this, but also with your camera on, please note that we are recording. So before we begin this fantastic program, I wanted to give you a little bit of background an update on our advocacy network. As Daniela said, today the IGCAN has grown into a network of over 600 individual contacts with people representing over 100 advocacy organizations, peer support groups, caregivers, nearly 100 countries represented in our network. It's fantastic. As we continue to develop IGCAN and make decisions on its direction, we always think back to Dicey Scroggins and her vision. So far, we have been seeing great interest in the IGCAN from sponsors and people all over the world. We know that Dicey would be so proud of our work. He would indeed, Mary. It has been a busy year for us our committee, and all the members of IGCAN. We have grown over the last year and have accomplished so much with the help of all of you. With our advocacy project and programs growing, we have been in contact with so many more advocates and groups wanting to get involved in the network and partner with us. One of those projects was the survivorship survey we conducted early this year. The results show us some of the gaps in survivorship care, and we learn how survivors and caregivers from all over the world felt about key issues. We took those results to help us develop education and provide information on the topics you felt important to your survivorship. If you have been following IGCS and EGCAN on social media this month, you should have seen some of the data we share and the full summary on our website. We also hosted a webinar to share the results in more detail and posted an executive summary on our website. That recording is on our website and YouTube channel if you want to see more. One of the topics that survivors wanted more information about was on intimacy and sex after cancer is an important topic because patients, unfortunately, don't have a good support by their care team. We hosted a webinar in August with Dr. Susan Carr and that recording is our 
website and the GCS YouTube channel. You see there. So, and now one of the most important goal by LGCS and EGCAN this year is to declare in June to be the Uterine Cancer Awareness Month. It's a really important goal for EGCAN and IGCS. With over 25 partner organizations supporting the, the campaign, we strengthened the, the network and worked together to raise awareness. It was an amazing what we, we were able to do in a, such a short time. And I hope this show just how a big an impact we can make when we all rise our voices, voices together. We are so grateful for all the support and the next year we hope to make an even bigger impact. And of course, there are other important awareness campaign that are organized by other group all year long. We increase our communication efforts this year during this time not only to support the campaign of our partners, but to raise awareness and provide helpful information. So a big thanks to all our partners. Also, some of you may have noticed that the advocacy section of the IGCS website was improved this year with even more content for patients and caregivers. We wanted to make it easier to share information about our programs and for the public to find information and resources about gynecologic cancer. We are also now displaying the logos of advocacy groups on the landing page of EGCAN. Any patient group can submit a request to join the network and have their logo display. Do not hesitate to do it. If you have a patient support group and are interested in adding your logo and link to our site, there is a form you can fill out on the web page. Thanks to the GCS team, especially thanks to Debbie Leopold for making all of this happen and supporting the network goals. Thank you, Debbie. And finally, I need to highlight another new exciting program. This year, in fact, we established the Daisy Scrudging Fund for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion with the special support of AstraZeneca and GSK. The purpose of the grant is to support projects that embrace diversity, seek equitable solutions and strive for inclusion of disparate groups affected by gynecological cancer. Eligible projects may include fieldwork, programming, research, or opportunities for patients and community outreach to improve the quality of life and access to care of support. If you want to learn more about these funds, go to the IGCS website, please. We are currently accepting grant proposal through the October 3rd. We are so proud to name this fund in honor of our friend, amazing friend, Daisy, who was so vocal about the gaps in cancer care and the need for patients' outreach and engagement. Thank you, Daisy, for all. And now it's time to move on the educational portion of today's summit. Mary, will you introduce our speakers? Yes, Daniela, thank you. It has been a great 2020 year for IGCS and IGCAN. You know, when the year was ending and I did my end of the year message, I challenged my team to think big this year. And after hearing all of this, Daniela, I think we did it. I think we did think big. And it's so exciting to be a part of this. And again, Dicey would be so proud of us. So our program is approximately three hours today. I think we have a really nice blend of some uh, educational talks. We also have a really fun art relaxation. And then we'll talk about a new program coming in 2024 called Lived Experience. So first, Dr. Godfrey Konecki will help us understand biomarkers. We hear a lot about this, how the molecular underpinnings of gynecologic cancers translate into these new treatments that are available. Followed by that will be Dr. Robert Coleman, 
who is really one of the premier clinical trialists in our specialty. And we're so grateful to have him today to talk a little bit about this amazing year we've had when it comes to clinical trials in gynecologic oncology. So following that, we'll have a little break and then we're gonna shift over. As I uh, mentioned, if you remember Dicey and some of the programs she used to do for us was so passionate about making sure the network had all aspects of the patient journey. She often spoke a lot about the importance of this creative expression for maximizing quality of life and to process the difficult emotions that so many of you feel as patients and caregivers. Our communication specialist, Debbie Leopold, is also very passionate about this work. And she's invited an expressive art therapist, Ms. Genevieve San Sanchez, to give us some ideas and inspiration. So it should be super fun. That sounds fun, Mary. Then we will conclude the summit with an exciting new communication initiative to elevate patients' advocacy efforts. The project will facilitate and encourage the patients, survivors, caregivers, and advocates to share and reflect on their personal stories, utilizing their lived experiences to create a powerful public narrative and call to action. So please stay until the end for a sneak peek at the project and find out how you can get involved. So let's get started. We will now begin our first educational presentation with Dr. Gottfried Canessy, who will explain what biomarkers are and how research in this area contributes contribute to new and novel treatment approaches. Dr. Canessy is the lead clinician for gynecologic oncology at the University of California in Los Angeles, and he is the group leader for the Transla Translational Oncology Research Laboratory, which focuses on preclinical drug and clinical trial development in the area of gynecologic malignancies. Dr. Conancy, welcome, and please share your screen. Thank you. Good morning, Daniela, and good morning, Mary. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, dear ladies and gentlemen. I, I will go to presenter mode. Yes, I uh, hope you can see my slides now. Um, I will be talking about biomarkers. And really, as Daniela had mentioned, this is a buzzword. We all hear a lot about it, but I'd like to provide some background information uh, and help you understand you know, what are biomarkers and what do we need to know about them as advocates, as patients, uh, and as caregivers. So, just think about a simple trait. Uh, here, an example, nothing to do with gynecologic oncology, red hair. That is a feature that you can see as a marker or a characteristic. It is either associated with where you come from, so it's something you can't change, or it could be a marker of something that you have an impact on where you can predict something like more likely getting a sunburn. So a very simple marker or char characteristic feature that can have two different traits. And I wanna emphasize, there are these two different types of a biomarker. And I wanna explain that for cancer on the role of the estrogen receptor. This is a cartoon of the estrogen receptor, a so-called homodimer sitting on top of a DNA strand and starting gene transcription. This is essential for the regulation of uh, many tissues and is a target for cancer therapy. Now, the estrogen receptor can be a prognostic biomarker. That means it can give you information on the natural course of a disease. This is basically information that you can't change. It tells you, for example, in this data set, this Kaplan-Meier curve, that those patients that are hormone receptor negative with endometrial cancer have a worse outcome compared to those that are hormone receptor positive. So it is a prognostic marker telling you important information on the prognosis of this endometrial cancer. Now, the Eastern receptor can also be a different type of a biomarker, 
what we call a predictive biomarker. It can predict the response to a treatment. This is a long-term data from breast cancer patients where you can see the impact of giving anti-hormonal therapy. And in this case, it's tamoxifen over a 10-year period and the substantial improvement on the outcome in patients with breast cancer. So having estrogen receptor predicts the responsiveness to anti-hormonal therapy. This is a biomarker that you can use to impact outcome uh, in cancers. In addition, it's also one that tells you what will the outcome be irrespective of treatments. And so the slide here demonstrates why do we need prognostic or predictive markers? Well, if you have a prognostic marker, the most important question will be, who do you need to treat? And who do you not need to treat? Because if you have a good outcome, you don't need treatment maybe. If you have poor outcome, natural poor outcome, you want to improve that. A predictive marker, on the other hand, tells you which treatment will be best. And we're very, very eager to develop predictive markers because we want to have tools at hand that we can provide patients with the most effective treatments. And so with a prognostic marker, again, you can avoid under-treatment or over-treatment. With a predictive marker at hand, you can individualize treatment and really enter the era of precision medicine. Bottom line, as shown in this cartoon, with a good predictive marker, you can pick those patients that are most likely to respond to a treatment. And this has, I think, been a characteristic feature of the last 10 years of how we've evolved in gynecologic oncology because we have developed more tailored treatments, but we can only use tailored treatments for individual patients if we have a marker to identify them and know who they are who are most likely to benefit from a certain treatment. Again, how do we measure biomarkers? This is a very broad description. On the top, you see a biomarker can have a prognostic role, tell you the outcome of disease. It can help you select patients. As you can see over here, a predictive versus drug A versus drug B. Or it can even be sometimes just a diagnostic to understand you know, what, what diagnosis does a patient have. And there are many ways of doing this, basically. You can use DNA. You can use protein. You can use, in fact, microbiome. Uh, recently, you can look at cellular components in the tumor microenvironment or other laboratory features to do that. And how do we measure biomarkers? Well, um, you have probably seen many test results, um, and these are either determined on DNA, which is basically the backbone, the hardwired genetic information for all of our life, which can be transcribed to a messenger RNA. You can determine biomarkers in messenger RNA or in protein, which is the final result. Mostly biomarkers are determined in DNA as it's very stable and protein as it's abundantly available after surgery and very stable. RNA is short-lived and therefore there are only a few tests and you need to have fresh frozen tissue, for example. So there are some certain limitations, but you can determine these markers at these different levels. And it's important to keep in mind because you may have test results. Some of them are determined on DNA and others in protein. Let's look at some of the new developments and Rob Coleman will talk in greater detail about the successes of how we've implemented these biomarkers in the treatment of patients with endometrial cancer. This is a busy slide, but it, what, it, what it shows you is an integrated, meaning a combined result of multiple tests done on a large number of patients with endometrial cancer. Now, each line is a patient from left to right. So these are over 250 patients, um, sorry, each column. Uh, and each line represents a different biomarker or characteristic feature that has been determined. And what the computer system does, it clusters these. And you can see they're very distinct groups of endometrial cancer. And there are now four well-described subtypes. So it's not one type of a disease. It's really four types of a disease. One to the left, very particular, is a poly hypermutator subtype. This is a subtype of endometrial cancer that has a mutation in a DNA repair gene called poly, and therefore has very distinct features that I'll speak to a little later. 
Then you have a group which is called MSI high, microsatellite instable, which has become a very important biomarker in selecting patients for immunotherapy. And you have a group which is determined copy number low, meaning very few gains and losses of DNA. This is also a feature that you can have errors in, in the DNA that you not have two copies, like one from your mother and your father, but you really gain like five, tenfold, or you completely lose a gene. And there you can have a lot of that or little. If you have little, you are copy number low. If you have high, you have um, a pretty messy DNA with a lot of gains and losses. So very distinct features that allow us really to stratify treatments. And if we look at endometrial cancer now, the distribution of these subtypes, about a quarter of patients in yellow are microsatellite instable. Another quarter are the so-called copy number high. Nearly half of patients are copy number low, and there's a small group that is pole E hypermutated. We haven't been doing these um, subtypings until recently because we have genomic and proteomic analysis available to identify these subgroups. And just a teaser to what Rob will show you later is looking at the efficacy of immunotherapy in recurrent endometrial cancer that is microsatellite high. Outstanding responses between here in smaller studies around 30% up to 60% uh, in recurrent disease with very little toxicity. This is a really an unheard activity in a selected subset determined by a biomarker. And you'll hear more to that later. If you look at the activity of immune therapy in a so-called biomarker negative group, and those are the ones that do not have microsatellite instability, those would be you know, the three quarters uh, left, the copy number low, copy number high. You see much, much lower responses or chances of responding to immune therapy as you see objective response rates ranging between six and 13%. So an important biomarker that predicts who responds and who does not. Now, you've heard a lot about microsatellite instability. What is that? Uh, I want to give you a brief primer so that you take something home from this meeting. This is a DNA double strand, um, the double helix wound, and you can see there are proteins surrounding it that are repairing mismatches. We suffer about 50,000 mismatches every day. So the integrity of our, our genome depends on high fidelity DNA repair. And you can see these four enzymes, MLH1, PMS2, MSH2, and MSH6 circling the DNA have the important job of repairing mismatches of the uh, DNA pairs. If any of these genes are mutated or silenced epigenetically, you accumulate more breaks and basically more mutations. And you can see in this cartoon, if you have on the red here on the right side, if you have a lot of mutations, it leads to altered proteins because the sequence changes. So the proteins look funky and odd. And what that does, it makes the tumor look very foreign. And with the matching MHC receptors on cancer cells that bind to the T cells, you then have engagement of immune cells because the tumor looks so foreign, it's so highly mutated because of the underlying mismatch repair deficiency. Now, why is it called microsatellite instability? It's simply because we zoom in on so-called microsatellites. These are DNA repeats, and they're just areas of the genome that are instable. So that's why they're called microsatellite instability. You can also say mismatch repair deficient. If you have normal cells, you have very few mutations, very few neoantigens expressed, like odd-looking proteins, and these cells do not look at all enticing for the immune system uh, to be attacked. Um, so it is a very distinct feature. How can you measure it? Well, you may have had reports in your hand. You can do it by immune histochemistry. You look at the protein. Are these four mismatch repair genes present or absent? You can look at RNA. You can do a PCR specifically for the genes in the microsatellite area. And there are six that are called out. 
Or you can use, you know, the fancy next generation sequencing approach, which looks at everything and you just go back and pick those regions of interest. There are different companies offering tests to do this. Your own pathology lab will probably work with immunohistochemistry. chemistry. Now let's look at the other subtypes of endometrial cancer. What biomarkers do we have? <clears throat> let's look at the copy number high. This is a group that basically has an inability to repair double-stranded DNA breaks, and they get reannealed or fixed with a lot of errors in that you have a lot of gains and losses. And I'm gonna skip one slide because I forgot the order, but what you do get is, for example, a gene that is present not in its normal form with two copies, one from your mother or your father, but it's amplified. So you have multiple genes, and this is an, an example for the HER2 gene being amplified. And you can see you don't have just 10,000 receptors, but you end up having 2 million receptors if this gene is present in multiple copies. We now know that it's an important biomarker, not only in breast cancer, where it's changed the world how we treat breast cancer, but in endometrial cancer. You can use this as a biomarker, as the data show that adding a HER2 inhibitor to chemotherapy improves outcome. So you need to check for this marker, particularly in certain subsets of uh, GYN cancers. And Rob will show you some exciting new data on this HER2 inhibitor uh, that just came out with novel drugs. I'm going to go back to other subsets. The copy number low group which has a distinct biomarker also, that is that these are mostly hormone receptor positive. This is an important predictive biomarker now for endometrial cancer also because of exciting data uh, by Dr. Manzur Mirza who showed that using a state-of-the-art anti-hormonal therapy, which is a combination of an aromatase inhibitor with a newer cell cycle inhibitor, works in endometrial cancer too, not only in breast cancer, it improves outcomes in patients with endometrial cancer, but only those that are estrogen receptor positive, particularly those that are in the blue copy number low group, as you can see here. Another interesting biomarker arising is P53. Now, P53 is the master guardian, basically the janitor of a house that fixes everything when it breaks. If you have a mutation in P53, a lot of things can go wrong, but if you're P53 wild type, meaning have no mutation in P53, we've seen that a novel drug called Selenexor or an inhibitor of a protein called exportin, as the name says, it exports, shuttles faulty proteins out of the cell into the surrounding and therefore protect cells from cancer is particularly effective in endometrial cancer. So we have a biomarker for the activity of selenexor, which is moving forward in endometrial cancer. Let's look at ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer has clearly uh, evolved as a uh, disease that can be, where treatments can be individualized. And if you look at the pie chart on the right side, you can see these are char characteristic biomarkers found in ovarian cancer. About a quarter of patients have mutations in genes that are uh, called BRCA1 or BRCA2. Uh, there is another quarter of these patients that actually have genetic silencing in these genes that are either by epigenetic silencing or they have other mutations that are involved in DNA double strand break repair. So. It amounts to that about 50% of patients with ovarian cancer have a deficiency in double-stranded DNA repair. They cannot re-anneal broken double strands, and that leads to characteristics such as gains and losses. The other half of ovarian cancer is HR proficient. So we have a very important biological distinction that by measuring these genes, either um, by sequencing them, <clears throat> some of them can be done by immunistic chemistry, we can split ovarian cancer into two main groups. And this has um, been either done by sequencing the BRCA gene or by measuring what we call homologous recombination deficiency, or also called the deficiency in repairing double-stranded DNA breaks. And the way you do that, um, and Rob will uh, show you more data, and he was uh, 
we were both involved in developing these um, assays that basically describe not only tumors that have a BRCA mutation, but those that are BRCA-like. So those that have epigenetic silencing or have other mutations that lead to the same result. And you can see, you look at the DNA from chromosome one to 22, and you look at areas that have gains or losses or are genomically instable, and then you can quantify that. You say, oh, it's 50%, it's 20%. And by doing that, you can see and study genomic instability as opposed to those that are biomarker negative that have a very stable genome and that are HR proficient. Now, why is it important? Because this is critical for predicting response to PARP inhibitor. PARP inhibits single strand on the left side, you can see. If a single strand breaks, you need PARP to fix it. If you inhibit PARP, as we do with PARP inhibitors, this can be critical and lethal for cells that cannot repair the resulting double strand break repair. A single strand break turns into double strand when a cell divides and replicates. If you have an intact double strand break repair, it doesn't matter because you then fix the damage set earlier. But if you have deficient double strand break repair, it becomes lethal. Synthetically lethal means two mechanisms one by themselves are not lethal, but if they're together, they can kill a cell. That's why HRD testing and BRCA testing is so critical. And we've shown it over and over that this biomarker predicts response to PARP inhibitors in the SOLO1 study, in the PRIMA study, in the PAOLO study. It makes a huge impact on patients with ovarian cancer, extends progression-free survival fourfold, now extends survival as recent studies have been shown. We know that in those that are BRCA-like, as you can see here, the effect is highly significant, somewhat less than with a BRCA mutation across multiple studies summarized here. And if we look at those that are HR proficient, that have no disability of double strand break repair, this PARP inhibitor is not synthetic lethal. So it's a very important biomarker for selecting patients um, for PARP inhibitor therapy, particularly in the frontline setting. Another biomarker that you may have heard of is cycling E. Cycling E is a critical regulator of the cell cycle. Cell cycle means that's the clock that regulates if one cell turns into two in a growth process. And cycling E regulates basically the entry into the S phase where DNA is duplicated. And if you have high levels of cycling E, that S phase is turned on. You have what we call premature S phase entry, and you have tons of DNA that's synthesized. These cells still don't necessarily become, uh, uh, or these cells become more aggressive, but there's a second checkpoint in place that stops them to some degree, the G2 checkpoint. And there are now new drugs like we one inhibitors, ATR, ATM, and these are done in clinical trials, and there may be a trial that's offered to you to assess these drugs, they inhibit that second survival checkpoint that keeps the integrity of a cell. If you lose that, they undergo what we call cell catastrophe or die, and you see that this DNA is just not generated in the right way, and these cells die. So cycling E is a marker for, for newer drugs that are coming along, such as we won ATR and ATM inhibitors. Um, and this is not uncommon. This is a biomarker that you can see. These are publicly available databases. In uterine carcinosarcoma, nearly 40%. In ovarian cancer, 30% to 40%. In ovarian cancer, um, also very high numbers. And particularly in the recurrent setting, higher numbers of cycling E amplification as opposed to uh, the primary tumors. Biomarkers for blood vessel growth, neoangiogenesis, very critical. And many of you have probably received the drug Bevacizumab, which inhibits uh, neoangiogenesis, which you need for um, the supply of oxygen and nutrients to tumor cells. And you can see there are many more potentially important receptors where we identify the targets. And these become biomarkers, such as VEGF, TIE2, and the list is long. 
Then we've been looking at very complex compositions of multiple biomarkers, and we need computers to do that. So we look at basically the expression of thousands of genes that are measured with high throughput techniques now, and we let the computer align similarities. And these signatures can provide us important information, not only of one biomarker, but often a whole set of biomarkers that are typical for individual patients. They can be associated with prognosis, but most importantly, they can also help us understand, for example, who benefits particularly well from bevacizumab. As shown here in a study that we conducted, that those that have a certain subtype, a signature, meaning a group of biomarkers, do particularly well uh, when they receive bevacizumab. Now, there's an exciting new area of biomarkers coming along. These are so-called cell surface markers. And Rob will show you some exciting new data of the first uh, drugs that have entered um, really the area in cervical and in ovarian cancer. Cell surface markers are proteins on the surface of a cell that are distinct for cancer cells, meaning they're differentially expressed they're absent in normal cells, but they're present in cancer cells. And that's a hugely attractive uh, target because if you can target or direct a treatment to something that's specific for cancer cells, it would mean it's better tolerated because you avoid normal cells, blood cells, hair cells, gut GI cells. So we're looking for biomarkers that are selective for cancer cells. And when you look at biomarkers that are present on the surface of cancer cells, well, then it's obvious these are things you can target with monoclonal antibodies. So if you screen for biomarkers that are present on cell surface, you can then develop drugs, not only antibodies, but you can link the antibodies to chemotherapy and develop basically targeted chemotherapy through so-called antibody drug conjugates. And you can see an example here of a large monoclonal antibody with chemotherapy attached to it. Now, this is a this is a real representation because the chemotherapy is a very small drug, but antibodies are huge molecules. So you can see that this is a construct that delivers these little payloads of chemotherapy to a biomarker or a receptor expressed on the surface of cells. And one of the best examples you'll hear more for from today is mervituximab seraftans, and this is an ADC that was just approved for ovarian cancer that is folate receptor positive, where patients express the folate receptor, therefore a biomarker for identifying the patients most likely to respond to mervituximab seraftans in. You need to have the protein expressed on the surface. This new antibody drug conjugate binds to the receptor and through that mechanism, the chemotherapy attached to the antibody is internalized and then activated only in cells that express the folate receptor. So a completely exciting new concept. There is a huge development program going on in identifying novel biomarkers on the surface of cells. And I just wanted to show you a brief example of one that we're very excited about developing at UCLA, a novel protein called Claudin-6. It's a membrane protein where we didn't really know what function it has, but it's exclusively expressed very, very highly in ovarian and GYN malignancies. As you can see, these are publicly available databases from left to right, and every dot represents a patient, and they measured Claudin-6 expression using RNA, and you can see the highest levels are seen on the right side, ovarian cancer, uterine carcinosarcoma, or endometrial cancer. So it's an interesting target for GYN malignancies. And what's so important is these are, again, publicly data bases where you can look at the expression of this in normal tissue. So is this biomarker differentially expressed? Is it expressed exclusively in cancers and not in normal tissue, which is what we want? We want to deliver a drug selectively to cancer cells. It is absent in normal cells. If you compare that, keep the red line in mind, we're far below the red line. If you look at HER2, there are ADCs out there that are targeting HER2 that can be safely given. So I do think with targeting Claudin-6, a new protein biomarker, 
for the development of ADCs as an ideal target because it's highly expressed in GYN malignancies and absent in normal tissues. The interesting thing is this is a biomarker that's mutually exclusive from folate receptors so that we now have possibly two biomarkers um, that can target different patient populations. Those that are folate receptor positive are likely clot in six negative and vice versa. However, I wanna caution my excitement a little bit because this is a bubble chart which shows you all of the attempts in developing biomarkers and targeting them with ADCs over the last years. And the um, purple, really represent discontinued projects where the drugs have failed, where the targets were not differentially expressed, or um, where the linker was inappropriate. Uh, the gray ones, those are the drugs that are still moving forward. And the small green ones show the currently approved drugs. So risk of failure, clearly, but great promise in developing biomarkers that are selective for tumors that we can target with ADCs. Another big topic is, and uh, again, biomarkers of immunotherapy. Uh, one of the most common biomarkers is the target itself of the most commonly used immune checkpoint inhibitors, such as pembrolizumab, nivolumab, dostalimab, is measuring the target itself, PDL1. And there are different scores that you will have on your reports, like a TPS score, percent staining per tumor cell, or down on the bottom, the CPS score the percent staining of all cells, including immune cells and tumor cells, so the combined positive score. And these have been used to quantify the expression of the target as a useful biomarker in predicting the likelihood of response to immunotherapy. But I just want to briefly touch upon, this is an exciting field of biomarker research because we've now discovered it's not just the target that we need to measure of an immune checkpoint inhibitor. There are many seemingly unrelated biomarkers, such as the gut microbiome, which has been associated with improved response to immune therapy. Others are the tumor mutational burden. So, you know, whether there are a lot of neoantigens present. There are other signaling pathways, such as interferon gamma, meaning activation of immune cells that are critical for it to be successful. So this is an evolving field where we're studying predictive biomarkers that will help us understand which patients to select for immune therapy beyond just using PDL1 one uh, expression. Uh, it also gets more complicated because, again, there's redundancy in immune checkpoints. That means nature does not just rely on inhibiting immune cells by one mechanism, PD1, PDL1, but a multitude of now pathways which are well described, some of them stimulating, some of them inhibiting the uh, T cell in attacking the tumor cell. So multiple new biomarkers that um, will be entering the clinic for selecting patients that are most likely to benefit from these new immune checkpoint inhibitors. It gets more exciting because we now have a higher resolution of our biomarkers. And I just want to touch briefly on single cell sequencing and multiplexed immunistic chemistry. Uh, single cell sequencing is something that is just happening in the last years. And what it means is, um, sorry, this is a, a pie chart which shows you how the cost has dropped in our sequencing prices. And if you look at something 20 years ago, the genome sequencing cost about $100 million. These prices have rapidly dropped down to about $100 now to $50, unimaginable. So this makes it possible that you basically don't sequence you know, a tumor, but that you can actually dissect the tumor into 1,000 cells or 2,000 cells and sequence each cell individually. And that's what's happening with single-cell RNA-seq. So you don't sequence the bulk, which is a mix of connective tissue and tumor. You, sing, you do sequencing in individual cells, which basically is 2,000 sequencing experiments for one tumor, which is an incredible data amount, but has now become financially doable. And by doing that, you can study biomarkers, not in the bulk tissue, but actually in single cells, 
which provides incredible opportunity to study adaptive responses when you treat a tumor with cancer, which cell uh, with, with chemotherapy, which cells survive, how do they change? So the resolution has become unimaginable now in understanding biomarkers, but also gives us the tool at hand to really, I think, solve some important problems like drug resistance. This is something that can be now done with immunistic chemistry, with newer techniques, what we call spatial immunomultiplex histochemistry, where you can actually look at multiple biomarkers on a single slide using um, complicated staining methods where you can decipher the cell populations and how they're in context with each other. So just showing you that the field of biomarker research is really expanding dramatically and giving us tools at hands that we can really understand in a better way what, um, what determines drug response or failure. Biomarker testing now, well, there are a lot of companies that offer it. And if it's not being done, you can ask for it. These are mostly available in, in the US area. Um, Foundation, Tempus, Myriad, Caris, they are growing and they uh, do these tests mostly on a genomic basis. Many of them are now adding protein markers, but these provide important, um, really key data for picking the appropriate treatment. One take home message again is there are different uh, genomic testing available. One is somatic testing and the other one is germline testing. Germline testing is something that is present in every cell. And this is a quiz for those who are still listening and not falling asleep. There's something wrong on this slide, as you can see. I wonder if you recognize. Actually, somatic testing and the tube have to be switched because you do germline testing in blood with normal cells. They carry the mutation that you inherit from your mother or your father in every cell of your body. If it's a somatic alteration, it's only in the tumor cell. So you use your tissue block from the tumor uh, to identify a mutation. These are distinct biomarkers. Um, they may not play a role for predicting response to treatment such as PARP inhibitors, but it's an important understanding whether you draw a biomarker in blood or in tumor tissue. The field is evolving furthermore because we can now assess biomarkers in cell-free DNA. Tumors shed DNA into the blood, and we may not need to do a biopsy now to obtain tissue to analyze all of these important uh, uh, markers but can do that on shed pieces of DNA or protein in the circulating uh, blood sample, which opens up the importance of the contributions of patients and advocates to the work of biomarker and to study of biomarkers, which basically are participating in research efforts where samples are being collected and pointing out to the importance when you do clinical trials and study the efficacy of a drug that there's emphasis on collecting specimens so that these types of analysis can be conducted. And if without this, without providing samples and specimens to do these studies, uh, we will never get answers to many treatments and understand which patients derive the greatest benefit and, and which patients the treatments do not work. Technically, discovery is possible, but the bottleneck is still having access to the appropriate tissues. And that's, I think, where patients and advocates in the community can really educate and demand that um, more focus be put on collecting these precious samples so that the studies that I tried to touch upon in my talk and help you explain really the, the magnitude of, of, of biomarkers that are evolving here um, can literally uh, uh, lead to changes in care of patients. And that um, is at the end of my presentation. My conclusion is yes, we need biomarkers. And here just a list of those that could be critical for your care. Thanks for your attention and I hope it wasn't too fast. Thank you, Dr. Conancy, for your interesting and amazing presentation. Now we can open the floor to questions. You may unmute yourself to ask questions. Don't be shy. 
We are like a big family. If you have any comments, share with us. Raise your hand to be called a Yupon or submit your question in the chat. So let me do a comment. So many steps forward, Dr. Conancy, have been made in gynecologic oncology last year, and more research are needed. But however, as you said, recently we often hear from the importance of microbiome and microenvironment for the cancer. So do you think there can be an association between microbiome, measure of biomarkers, and therapeutic effect of antineoplastic drugs? And which kind of suggestion can we tell to our women, to our patients? Thank well, you. that's a that's a very good question. And I think it's a very cutting edge question because um, there are recent studies that show that um, there are certain bacteria in the gut microbiome that are associated with improved response to immune therapy. Um, and uh, there's a certain form of Clostridium bacteria, which was shown to be uh, particularly associated. I would say there is no clear recommendation for patients now uh, that you could test your microbiome and then select to do immunotherapy or withhold it. Uh, but research is ongoing in that area. And for me, my personal um, bias is, you know, you never know if, um, if it is the reason for immune therapy to work well, or is it because you were on immune therapy that your microbiome has changed? So I do think we have to wait for further studies to understand it, but there's clearly the great potential that the gut microbiome has a much greater impact on, um, on uh, basically immune environment uh, than we understand, but there's no validated biomarker yet available uh, where patients could base their decisions on. Okay, thank you, Dr. Conancy. A lot of questions are coming in our chat for you. So Deborah asks you, testing for somatic or germline biomarkers once someone is diagnosed doesn't seem to be standard of care. Should mm -hmm. it be now? Yes particularly for ovarian cancer, because it has immediate implications for um, um, for treatment. Um, personally, I also think that it should be done for patients with uterine cancer, for example, um, particularly those that are um, diagnosed with the more rare subtypes, such as serous or clear cell endometrial cancer. Um, even, and it's my opinion, um, even if it doesn't yield um, a lot of extra information, for example, it's less likely to provide some, you know, therapeutic options for endometrioid endometrial cancer that's hormonally uh, driven. Um, nevertheless, uh, a good example is uh, a patient with endometrial cancer that has been treated over years and years with chemotherapy and surgery, and we submitted a tissue. And she was one of those 5% that had a pol e hyper -mut uh, mutation, which allowed us to select therapies like immunotherapy uh, due to the multitude of mutations that the genomic test revealed. Um, she's received many targeted therapies and has been free of uh, a recurrence for eight years now. So um, again, uh, this testing will not provide answers in every case, probably in a subset of patients, but it's much better than, you know, um, guessing what treatment may work best. Um, and yes, we're on the forefront, I think, of a new development, but we can only do it when we implement testing, when we ask for it, and we understand the importance of biomarkers um, and not just accept that there is a one-size-fits-all approach. Everybody gets chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, and surgery. Um, we don't have all answers yet, but to your question, I would strongly advocate to ask and request biomarker testing from your physicians. Uh, they will help you make a decision what is validated and what tests are helpful. But if you don't ask it, I've seen many patients um, that have been halfway through their treatments and where some of the you know critical biomarkers have never been assessed. Thank you. And Dorothy is raising your hand. Please, Dorothy. Thank you. 
Yes, um, I serve as a research patient advocate for NRG oncology. So I get involved at the stage when trials are in the design concept stage on through. So my question, actually a couple of questions are, as we look at trials, if they're not specifically related to biomarkers, should we be looking to have included additional sample collection? Would that require a secondary objective be stated? And what tests should we be advocating for so that they get included in the trials at the design phase? Yes, 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 and yes to everything that you said, because I could give you uh, 20 examples of studies where uh, the intention, the objective was fantastic, um, and that uh, in the end, the endpoint was not met, where um, there was no major improvement in outcome that led to the approval of the drug, and where the question remains, is there a subset of patients that benefits from it? Um, and the only way we can answer that is having tissues available or blood specimens that will then allow us to say, well, the pathway you targeted um, was successfully inhibited if the patients were selected in the right way. You know, a good example is um, if you look at a drug that targets HER2 in breast cancer, uh, Herceptin has changed uh, the way we treat breast cancer. Uh, it's only effective in 20% of patients. If this drug would have been pursued in all comers, the overall reported response rate would have been 2-3%, um, and no one would have picked up on that as a successful drug. So you need to understand uh, it, a drug doesn't work in everybody, and you need to know that it is a subset of patients that is likely going to respond to it. And we often don't have the answers up front, so we need to at least make sense out of data and results in hindsight. And that's where tissue specimens and blood collections help. And we're doing it too little and um, we're in far too few studies. Is there any verbiage or any suggested um, um, way of requesting this that, or that we could look at or that could be helpful to those of us who do get involved at that stage where we could bring something up with in a more specific way as opposed to just saying, hey, we should include some biomarket testing? Yeah, no, I think um, I, I think the discussion should be made that, and you are very powerful in that position that you can say, well, uh, I know everybody at this table is designing this trial is hopeful that it will work, but keep in mind it may not work in every patient. A good example is the recent data of an axial inhibitor. You, you know, you know that 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 is a targeted therapy that in the overall outcome didn't pan out to what we hope it to be, but if they were able to collect the right specimens, they can go back and say, well, was it only in those patients at high levels of axial expression? Um, is there a certain subset of those? And so when you design the studies, um, you know, to integrate a question that let's develop a backup plan, should this not be a slam dunk in the beginning? Can we at least understand why it didn't work? And you can't do that based solely on clinical uh, data that you collect, but really looking at the tumor tissue is important. Um, you know what? I don't want to have sort of a general um, uh, clause that you say, oh, you have to collect tumor and bi biomarkers. That's going to be the cure and that will fix everything. But I think being thoughtful and raising that question and saying, well, you're designing the trial. I'm a patient advocate. Um, you know, are we also addressing important translational questions, biomarker questions, and how is that part of it? Uh, and having that discussion and then incorporating it, I think makes sense. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Conancy. And uh, thank you for all your questions from audience. We have a bit in delay, so it's time to move into our next presentation with Dr. Rob Coleman presenting updates on clinical trials. Dr. Coleman is our amazing past president of IGCS, and for many years, he practiced gynecologic oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center. He is an established investigator and author of hundreds of scientific publications. Now, he is the chief medical officer at Vanyam Group, which is a global healthcare communications company specializing in biopharmaceutical innovation. Dr. Coleman, welcome, and please share your screen. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Danielle. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for those of you out, out in other time zones. It's so great to be with you today, and thank you for the kind invitation and introduction. I'm hoping my internet will stay stable. I just went unstable, just like uh, microsatellite instability we were talking about before. My my internet went unstable. Um, so hopefully uh, with a reboot, <laughs> it'll, it'll stay up for the rest of this talk. So um, I've been asked to uh, synthesize all that's happened in 2023. So um, bear with me. We'll, we'll, we'll try to cover the high points here. There's been a lot of uh, really fantastic work that's been done. And I really appreciate uh, Dr. Uh, Konechny's, um this talk that precedes this because it really does set up the understanding for why these trials worked or didn't work. Um, these biomarkers are incredibly important for understanding of not only what are prognostic implications. So as he mentioned, you know whether or not this particular uh, feature of the tumor will be a at a positive or have a more adverse uh, type of event to it, or can it be predictive or can it be both? And predictive um, biomarkers would be ones that actually show that a potential personalized therapy, as he mentioned, would be valuable. So um, those are my disclosures. So I'm going to start off with an amitral cancer. This is probably the most exciting of the, of the cancers that we've had uh, with respect to development. There's been so much uh, of uh, of an understanding, and there's really a great need for this. As you can see, this is our most commonly diagnosed cancer in the United States. Uh, fortunately, many of these patients will have uh, a low grade uh, or a limited disease where surgery or some adjuvant therapy will actually cure those patients. We never see uh, them have a recurrence, but there's a substantial proportion of patients that do suffer this uh, recurrence, um, and uh, and they uh, are. Uh, of increasing interest because of the potential biomarkers that we may be able to take advantage of in developing new therapy outside of our kind of our standard surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. But what's really interesting um, and really presents challenges for us about endometrial cancer is that although across the uh, cancer spectrum, almost every cancer that we talk about in 2023 has experienced a reduction in its mortality um, uh, rates. But endometrial cancer is one of about three or four cancers that actually is, is exhibiting the opposite. And so it really puts uh, the challenge in front of us of, of what we need to, to do. Now, Dr. Konechny mentioned about this molecular characterization of endometrial cancer. This is really important because, uh, and this is, um, this is kind of a, a broad overview of how these tumors kind of isolate them out into these four subgroups. But as he mentioned, even in these within these subgroups, particularly these copy number low and copy number high kind of broad categories, we have many subcategories that we've been able to take advantage of with novel therapies. But this represents really a dramatic sea change over what we used to um, evaluate, how we used to see endometrial cancer as a collective. We used to talk about a type one and a type two. They were very broad, phenotypical um, categorizations based on age and kind of natural history. And with, with some rare exceptions, some isolated biomarkers that characterize these specific cohorts of patients. Now we know, um, and it's much more important that we know, that there are very specific mutational alterations that define these patient populations, these tumor populations, for instance, that we can now take advantage of. And the one I'm gonna start off with is one where we've had the most exciting um, kind of sea changing, uh, practice changing data emerge. And that's this role of immunotherapy in certain types of endometrial cancer. So Dr. Konechny mentioned that, um, that there is this idea that in these tumors that carry a, uh, an inability to correct small um, alterations or mismatch, um, uh, mismatches in the DNA div dividing process, can lead to higher levels of tumor neoantigens. And what that term means is that there are components of the tumor that make them uniquely visible to the immune system. And we know that, um, that there are many ways that the immune system can actually be excited and recognize this tumor as a foreign product. Um, and a lot of that comes from these neoantigens that are, that are being expressed. And you can see in an endometrial cancer that tumors that carry this high level of microsatellite instability 
or those tumors that have innately high tumor mutational burden. And to some extent, those tumors that also carry this PDL1 expression can actually predict in certain tumor types in a response to immunotherapy. Well, in endometrial cancer, you can see that there's a lot of um, overlap between this mutational um, event and the microsatellite in stable tumors that we see uh, in, in our endometrial cancers. And when we look at these carefully in the tumor microenvironment, and, and Dr. Kanechi showed a similar kind of picture, we can see that when the tumors are instable or have a high, um, um, uh, have a high tumor mutational burden, these two bottom ones, MSI and pol e when we look at certain cells that we want to see in the tumor microenvironment, the ones that actually can kill cancer cells, these brown cells that you see on this, on this left-hand panel here on the bottom represent a infiltration of these tumor cells into the microenvironment. So these cells that are activated and ready to kill cancer cells are drawn into the tumor microenvironment because there are all of these neoantigens. And on the right hand, on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see it says predicted neoantigen load. And you can just see how these different tumor types can lead to high levels of these uh, neoantigens and high levels of these CD3 and CD8, these killer cells that actually go into the tumor and start to, to attack it. And so we've been able to leverage this into the use of these immunotherapies. And Dr. Um, Kineshi mentioned that there were some single agents, uh, immunotherapy agents, that have been utilized in this setting that have demonstrated objective response. And what's, what's so important for us when we develop clinical trials to assess this is that we find out that the tumors that don't carry these characteristics, we do not see that same kind of objective response that we see with the tumors that carry this. So this is that predictive kind of component of the biomarker. In this case, the biomarker being microsatellite instable tumors or high tumor mutational burden. Tumors that carry that are going to be uniquely situated to respond to an immunotherapy. Tumors that don't carry that are unlikely to have a strong effect with these immunotherapy agents alone. So we decided to put this to the test in two big trials that were presented at the SGO meeting earlier this year. One is called uh, NRG GY018, which was this phase three trial that was looking at patients who had um, advanced stage or recurrent disease and had a good performance status. In this particular trial, there were essentially kind of two trials that were run at the same time. And they were divided by whether or not the tumor carried this microsatellite instability uh, or, uh, or a, what we call deficient in MMR proteins um, uh, status. So we had one where this was uh, a set of tumors that had that problem and a set of tumors that didn't carry that, the, that phenotype. And what we were looking at was chemotherapy, standard chemotherapy, platinum, with the addition of either uh, an immune checkpoint inhibitor. In this case, it was pembrolizumab. And the idea was to use that pembrolizumab as a maintenance therapy after the completion of chemotherapy. Now, this was a big trial. Uh, it had a, a lot of patients. And you can see the proportion of patients that actually carried this, this, um, uh, this molecular phenotype here of a DMMR was about 225 patients out of about almost 800 uh, patients. And so what we saw was <clears throat> this big separation in curves. And I know every time I show curves like this, I always wonder whether or not people actually understand what I'm showing. But the idea is, is that this represents, these curves represent the proportion of patients that um, are kind of either, in this case, disease-free and alive. So this is progression-free. So as time goes on, patients will um, experience a recurrence of their tumor. And so they then kind of fall along this blue line on the bottom. The patients that don't experience a progression are then uh, proportionately higher. And they kind of fall along this, whatever color this is, this, this to dark brown line. And so if there's a big separation between these two curves, it means that the proportion of patients who recurred on the therapy is much lower than the patients who um, were not on the therapy. And so I just drew this line at 12 months and you can see that at 12 months, about three quarters of the patients um, ha are still have not, are still alive and have not progressed. Whereas the patients on the control arm, it was about 38%. So this is in the patients who carried a deficiency of, this, of, this, of these proteins and had a high uh, or would be considered as having instable tumors. And you can see it's about twice as high 
that um, patients would, would be without progression if they were getting the therapy. And this is a big difference. Now, most of the curves look like the one on the right, where they're kind of overlapping for the for early on, and then they kind of separate a little bit at the end. This is still considered a statistically significant result, but you can see the magnitude of effect when we see the matching of the biomarker with the drug. The other trial that was presented at the same time, and both these trials were actually published at the same time, was a different immune checkpoint inhibitor called Dostarlamab, and it was a very similar design. You can see that this was Pactax paraplatinum, Pactax paraplatinum, both arms, Dostarlamab being used with, with during chemotherapy and as a maintenance. And you can see this is, um, again, done in patient populations that carry both the deficiency of the MMR proteins and then also the overall. This was a much smaller trial because it was really focused on first this, um, this uh, biomarker positive population and then kind of the overall population. But these curves look very similar. <laughs> so you can see lots of white space between the blue and the red curves, uh, again, representing a substantial improvement in the, or a reduction in the probability of a progression event if they were, if these um, uh, uh, tumors were treated with dostarlamab with chemotherapy. And a smaller effect you can see here in the overall population being driven by lower efficacy of these drugs in patients whose tumors did not carry this defect. And in this particular trial, we also have early signal on overall survival. So progression-free survival represents the time from randomization until a progression event that's been documented. Overall survival looks at the overall from the time of randomization until death from any cause. And so you can see again, it looks like in the, in the patient population uh, who carry this um, alteration in their tumors, and in the overall population, even though these are immature study, uh, immature results, you can see there's a lot of white space starting to emerge between these therapies. And this is important because the patients who were on this trial who did not receive an immune checkpoint inhibitor in the, in, during this, this therapy because they were either um, randomized that way or they didn't carry the biological signature, they had access to an immunotherapy uh, in the next lines of therapy. And so this overall survival in the overall population probably resent, represents a mixed population of patients who received immunotherapy at, at, at some point in time. And you can see at the bottom here that the proportion of patients in the overall po population that received immunotherapy was twice as high in the patients who were randomized to the placebo arm as opposed to the dostarlamab arm. So there is some opportunity to receive these drugs later. And we've iterated this on this because we've now um, incorporated another therapy, uh, in this case, a PARP inhibitor uh, called Olaparib. And this trial will be presented in, in its, uh, its results here in a, a few weeks. Uh, but it was announced earlier this year that this trial was meeting its primary endpoints. So we're very excited to see whether or not the addition of, a, of another drug, so a second drug in the, in the maintenance phase, actually helps um, patients with this disease. So again, lots of progress based on a biomarker, matching a drug to the patient, to the tumor characteristic and seeing out long-term outcomes of patients. Huge, huge sea change, overnight changing the standard of care. So we're very excited that we've been fortunate enough to have this uh, available to us in the United States and now soon will be around the world. Now, as, uh, as Dr. Kanechi mentioned, that there were some there were some exciting uh, new drugs that were coming that were focusing on this external surface characteristics of proteins. He talked about HER2. And so we know that there are tumors uh, in the endometrial space in these, what we call the copy number high uh, subcategory that express this particular um, protein on the surface. In the past, we had focused on whether or not these tumors had an amplification. So a specific characteristic of this HER2 protein um, uh, of these genes and of the HER2 protein in the tumor microenvironment. But we learned following the kind of the example of our um, breast cancer colleagues that there were tumors that may not have as highly expressing tumors, but maybe be able to take advantage of not only just targeting HER2 by the antibody, but actually using that as a way to bring chemotherapy into the cell as part of an antibody drug conjugate. And you'll see that represented as ADC. In this case, it's, it's, it's a drug um, called uh, uh, trastuzumab drexatecan, and the drexatecan component of it is a type of chemotherapy agent that we have had a lot of experience in the GYN space. These are these camptothecin analogs. 
uh, or a topoisomerase at one inhibitor. So we've been very excited when this particular drug started to enter the clinic in the GYN space, and it was predominantly brought there through a, a trial called Pan Des the Destiny Pan Tumor O2 trial. Now this was just presented, so at ASCO uh, back in June, but you can see that of the number of different tumor types that were evaluated in this, um, in this, in this uh, disease, all three of the major GYN tumors in the ovary and cervix all had a component. And um, this is kind of a preview of the next several slides, but you can basically see that in each of these tumor types that there were uh, patients who had an objective response. And what was really fascinating about this particular um, um, disease state is that we started to see responses in patients who had lower levels of this expression of the protein. Now, remember when we started talking, um, when I mentioned earlier that we had focused on this as a drug target for amplified tumors, which is a small proportion of, of, our, of our patient population. So look, going after tumors that just had expression of the protein in, in the tumor microenvironment at lower levels was very exciting for us because it opened up the opportunity for a broader, uh, a broader opportunity for uh, patients who have this disease who have this. So now we're staining for this to make sure that we have the potential opportunity for it. And what was really um, uh, fascinating is around the same time that this was presented, we also saw a paper appear in the Journal of Clinical Oncology looking at the efficacy of this drug, um, uh, 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 trastuzumab drexatecan, in patients who had uterine carcinoma sarcoma, particularly difficult tumor to treat. And again, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, these are all tumor changes from baseline. And you can see going down is a good thing. And, and you can see these objective response rates were actually quite um, remarkable in this very difficult to treat tumor. So we were very excited about that. And of course, we were so excited about it that we asked the NCCN to list this as a potential option for patients with select tumor. And you can see down at the right-hand side of the screen in the most recent update, it just came a couple of days ago, that this drug now, trastuzumab drexatecan, is now listed as an, oper as an opportunity for patients. This becomes important because this allows us in many cases to get insurance coverage for um, eligible patients. Now there's um, others in endometrial cancer that are kind of focusing on this kind of same, kind of retreading the same path. This is sacatuzumab, again, another drug we borrowed from breast cancer, uh, which is focusing on the overexpression of a different protein. So instead of HER2, uh, we're now looking at TROP2. And again, this particular um, uh, therapy you can see had an objective response in endometrial cancer patients with of around 33% um, with some very good PFS and overall survival characteristics. So we're very excited now to have kind of this expansion of these therapies and it's not stopping there. So as, as Dr. Konechny mentioned, there are many new drugs that are kind of working their way through based on all of these new findings in the tumor microenvironment, including P53 alterations, whether they're normal or abnormal, DNA damage repair, as he mentioned, we won. You heard that before about this, about what we see in, um, uh, in as a check, as a, as a DNA um, um, uh, cycle, cell cycle checkpoint uh, that allows uh, for correction of errors and, um, and uh, are a big expansion in hormone therapy. So really super exciting to see all this. And there, of course, there are a number of trials that are ongoing now to help um, reclassify both the frontline and the recurrent setting. So I just hope, I just gave you a taste of it because there's so much going on in endometrial cancer. We're so excited about that. Now I'm gonna shift over to, uh, to ovary cancer. Um, again, um, the very, um, this is the kind of the natural history of this disease, which is dramatically changing, uh, mostly on the basis of two very important drugs classes here. One is being the antiangiogenesis inhibitors, which many of you probably have had access or exposure to, and then the PARP inhibitors, um, as uh, was mentioned by Dr. Konechny, being really pivotal. And these are, um, been, have been uh, you know, identified through clinical trials to show efficacy first in patients with recurrent uh, disease, then as a maintenance therapy for patients who have, with chemotherapy-sensitive recurrent diseases um, um, uh, as a maintenance therapy, as I mentioned. And then it was moved into the frontline setting, and there are now seven frontline trials. There's five listed here on the slide but they're basically all based showing the same thing, that in patients that carry this predictive biomarker of a BRCA mutation have a, the strongest effect on preventing disease recurrence. In patients that carry a signature uh, called HRD, 
homologous recombination deficiency, but her wild type for BRCA basically showing not quite a strong effect, but a very strong effect. And then even in patients that are wild type for uh, both of these biomarkers, in some cases we do see an impact on therapy, but it's graded here. And so this basically relates to that feature that he mentioned earlier on about homologous recombination deficiency representing alterations for, uh, that are in the tumor microenvironment for DNA repair and taking advantage of that as a way to distinguish a therapeutic effect on cancer cells without harming normal cells. So a very, very strong treatment effect. Now, with respect to new things coming in this disease, um, we've, done, we've had a lot of reports of, of uh, findings that haven't really um, changed too much. I'm going to talk a little about those that have, but I wanted to draw attention to something that we don't talk of a lot about in these kind of courses, and that's the role of surgery and the role of uh, this uh, HIPAC. Now, HIPAC is a heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy strategy. It is extremely controversial. I'm not going to I'm not going to take a side here, um, but I will say that there is evidence mounting that under certain conditions and under certain um, strategies that this may um, may provide a benefit. But again, this has to be done in selected centers. It has to be done uh, under controlled situations. And what I'm presenting to you here is a trial that's trying to take advantage of a standardized approach that involves all of the knowledge that we have today, which includes the, the genomic status of the tumor, as well as the dose and the timing and the temperature that we use for the therapy uh, for, this, uh, for this process. So HOT is a trial that's ongoing now that's trying to evaluate the role of heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy given at the time of a um, interval cytoreduction. reduction. And again, this is randomized, so hopefully it will be informative. Another one in the, another trial in the frontline setting that um, we're excited to see getting closed is a drug that has been around for about two decades called Orogovimab. Now, Orogovimab was developed as an immunotherapy targeting CA125. Again, another surface protein that um, uh, 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 that many of you are familiar with uh, that that we capture in the blood as a as a biomarker. But in this case, what we're doing is we're to, we're targeting an antibody to that chemical. And this um, uh, has been evaluated in ovarian cancer without much success in the past. However, we learned a lot during the process and we re retooled this based on um, a very selective patient population and administration sequence to try to take advantage of where this drug may work. So this trial has uh, nearly completed its enrollment and uh, we're very excited to see uh, this uh, report out to see whether or not this antibody approach actually can help impact patients with certain types of, of advanced stage ovarian cancer. But the area that um, Dr. Godfrey, um, uh, uh, Dr. Kanechi mentioned um, uh, that has seen a lot of innovation has been in these antibody drug conjugates. I just mentioned two of them, uh, trastuzumab, deruxetecan, and sacatuzumab, um, targeting the trope 2 But this has um, been really started in the uh, ovarian cancer space. And again, these drugs, are essentially an antibody, which is this complex molecule that has these little linkers that hold onto a chemotherapy agent. And again, the strategy here is to use the antibody to get to the cancer cell, get, it gets incorporated into the cancer cell, and the linkers, for the most part, are broken so that the drug is released into the cell. When the cell dies, some of that chemotherapy drug diffuses into the tumor microenvironment, creating a bystander effect and in some cases also activates some of the immune cell response. So it has this kind of multiple opportunity uh, for um, cell kill. And so the trial uh, that really demonstrated the first value here was uh, a drug that he mentioned called mervituximab, um, uh, sort of tansine. This, is a, this was the phase two study that we did that showed that there was an objective response rate of over 32% in a heavily pretreated patient population and the duration of response more than uh, more, almost six, uh, seven months, this isn't correct here on the slide, almost seven months. And that led to a phase three trial, which was presented in June uh, that you can see, uh, Dr. Kenechi was uh, a, a key uh, investigator on this particular trial that was looking at this compared to investigation, investigator's choice chemotherapy in patients whose tumors expressed a large amount of this surface protein called folate receptor alpha. And so this trial was very straightforward. 
We took the patients, as you can see, the eligibility over here, defined largely by their uh, key characteristics with response to previous chemotherapy and their tumor um, uh, expression of this particular protein. And we randomized them to either the drug or investigator choice chemotherapy. And the bottom line is that it worked. Again, remember how these, how you interpret these curves. These represent the proportion of patients that are without a progression event. And this arrow I wanted to highlight because you'll see it's look, a, there's a big sharp drop off um, uh, at around, around um, six weeks. This represents a CAT scan that was done as per um, um, required by the protocol. And so this is important because what this shows you is that most of the patients who um, were identified with a disease progression on the, on the, um, on the control arm came, had this event happen when a CAT scan was done and showed that the tumor got bigger. So th in this case, it wasn't because the symptoms caused the investigator to try to get a CAT scan. It's because when they got the CAT scan at the very first time after two cycles of treatment, the disease had progressed. And I know some of you have experienced this problem, um, this issue. It's it's what we see frequently um, in 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 uh, particularly in ovarian cancer drug development. But you can see that that same point of time on the experimental arm, the merbetuximab arm, we only see about a drop down to about 80, 83 or so percent, whereas it's about 65, 66 percent on the on the blue curve. And so that protection for progression represents this. Um, this reduction in, in um, or what we call the hazard for progression. And so you can see over here on the right-hand side that the hazard for progression was, was 0.65, which represents, to put it in another way, is that there's a 35% protection against progression if you, if, if you were treated with this drug versus not. And if you look at the degree of these responses, you can see this is representing the change from baseline. So there's, when they go to 100%, that represents a, usually a complete response. And you can see how it is with the new drug, mervituximab, versus investigator choice chemotherapy. And when you look at a trial like this, you always have to go back and say, well, what would I expect to get out of chemotherapy alone in the general population? And this 16% is right on target. It's about what we see for investigator choice chemotherapy for patients whose tumors have progressed under six months after a platinum-based therapy. So very consistent with the, what we expect. And you can see it's about three times higher in um, patients who got mervituximab. And this actually added to the overall survival metric as well. So this is now being moved um, into uh, another phase. So just like with PARP inhibitors, we started with recurrent disease, and then went into the platinum-sensitive maintenance um, phase, Gloriosa, is a maintenance phase trial with bevacizumab, the antiogenesis drug that we talked about before, uh, in patients who have responded to um, platinum-based therapy and have high folate receptor alpha uh, tumors. So that's a big win for us, and we're hoping that this will extend um, uh, even further. Um, because of the success of this type of drug and targeting mechanism, several other companies are entering into the space. This is another folate receptor alpha targeted drug, it's constructed differently than mervituximab. Um, so, uh, and this is undergoing uh, evaluation. I share with you here because this is an active ongoing trial program. And if you have access to it, um, please consider it. One of the benefits of this particular trial is that it's looking for lower levels of folate receptor alpha expression. The proportion of patients that have high levels is about, six, is about 33% or so. So there's many patients that aren't eligible because they don't, their tumors don't carry high levels of this folate receptor alpha expression. This particular asset is trying to get into that other patient population as well. And so we're hopeful to see um, if this actually works. Um, this is just some uh, preliminary uh, uh, data uh, uh, to uh, look at uh, the, the overall kind of efficacy. It's, it's it, again, showing some promise that in patients that carry lower levels, you look at the bottom here, where it says the uh, TPS scores of 25 to 75%. So these would be patients not eligible for merbetoximab that we're seeing a 33% response rate. So again, we're excited. Hopefully this will, will move forward. And as I mentioned, um, because uh, this uh, pan uh, tumor, o Destiny Pan Tumor O2 trial did carry an ovarian cancer cohort, I'm gonna share that data with you. So again, you saw this before, but we saw a 45% response rate. And look over on the right-hand side, patients that had lower levels of expression of, of uh, HER2 still had a 37% response rate. 
So very interesting. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. So as, as Dr. Konechny mentioned, that big pie chart with all those circles in it, many of those have ovarian cancer cohorts um, uh, as well and are, are really moving forward fast into the space. The last thing I'm going to mention, because I'm uh, just almost about out of time, is about cervical cancer. Um, that one of the, again, a topic we don't talk a lot about is surgical management of cervix cancer. In general, this is what a, a uterus that has a radical, what we call a radical hysterectomy. This, so this, this, you can see the very bottom of this, uh, of, this, of this picture is the cervical cancer. And you'll see as part of that surgical procedure is where those clamps are, which is called the parametria. So we take out the cervix, the uterus, and the tissue around it because that's where cancer cells can grow and into and spread to the lymph nodes. And so the question is, is that, are we being too radical? Because in many cases with smaller tumors, the proportion of patients that actually have disease in that tissue that we take out, which can take, um, which adds time and potential toxicity to the patient, particularly with bladder dysfunction, um, uh, it's very infrequent. So you can see only 0.3% of the time with a radical procedure like this for small tumors, we don't even need, we didn't need it. So the concept was, well, can we do a simpler uh, procedure and get away with it. And so uh, this has been the focus of two trials that have been reported, uh, one called the CONSERVE trial, which showed that there was a very low rate of positive nodes and a very low rate of recurrence in doing something very simple, such as a, um, um, uh, uh, a more limited resection. In this particular case, also providing the opportunity for fertility sparing, so only doing a conization uh, with lymph nodes I was able to uh, retain the uterus and allow for fertility sparing option. Another trial called the SHAPE trial was recently reported this year as well, which was comparing standard of care radical surgery versus a simple surgery. Again, looking at, um, at recurrence and you can see that the curves are basically overlapping. So this provides a new opportunity for our patients who have, um, who have you know, uh, uh, a lower, an opportunity for lower toxicity and have an opportunity for um, uh, 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 for fertility sparing. So really excited to see this uh, move forward. The last topic I wanna mention just briefly is, uh, is uh, immunotherapy. Most cervix cancer is caused by a virus. Um, so it makes sense that immunotherapy could actually work. Uh, in this situation, we've tried to take advantage of that, not only in recurrent setting, which we've demonstrated high, high degrees of success, but also in the opportunity of preventing recurrence in patients who are at risk but have not had recurrence. And so what I'm sharing with you here is some data that's emerging as an adjuvant therapy to patients who would otherwise be curable with standard treatment with chemo radiation. And the idea here is that the chemotherapy will release more of these neoantigens into the tumor microenvironment and make the cell even more immunogenic. So we have we have kind of split this um, kind of um, uh, the results on this. We have two trials, one called CALA, which we, which unfortunately did not seem to benefit patients, but another one called um, A18, which appears to have done that. Now we haven't seen the data yet, but we know it's a positive trial that should be coming out here with the ESMO meeting in the near future. So we're very exciting. It's very excited to see that, um, that particular data it was actually announced in a press release back in July that it actually met its primary endpoint. So we we're super excited about that. Now we, we have had um, a lot of experience with, um, with immune therapy and cervix cancer. And one of the great benefits um, was in patients who had recurrent disease, this overnight also changed standard of care because now we were able to identify patients who were getting our best therapy, which was Pacotaxel and Platinum plus Bevacizumab. And we added uh, Pembrolizumab to this. This is the immune therapy. And we showed for every one of the endpoints that we were looking at, including progression-free survival, objective response, and overall survival that we were able to measurably and really clinically impactfully change the natural history of this disease. And you can see there's about a 40% reduction in the prevention of recurrence and 40% extension of life. So again, big, big wins. And these data were just updated uh, three months ago at the ASCO meeting. Last category I'll talk here because we've talked about it in every one of them is these antibody drug conjugates. The one that we um, were very uh, tightly uh, involved with first was this tosotamab adotin, which is, again is an antibody drug conjugate uh, bringing a cytotoxic uh, payload called MMAE 
and it was targeting tissue factor, which is expressed largely on, the cer on, on cervical and other tumors. And this demonstrated an objective response rate, which was about twice as high as the expected with chemotherapy. In this case, it was around 24%, with patients extending their duration of response over eight months. So it was a big, big, big win. So we had approved that, or we had, so we got accelerated approval for this, but we needed to prove it. So this is available to us already, but we needed to prove it in a phase three trial. And this is going to be um, uh, discussed also very soon at the ESMO meeting which was looking at this drug versus investigator choice chemotherapy. And we're highly anticipating that this will be a positive uh, trial result for us as well. So again, I'll get back to the last ADC I'm gonna talk about again, which was this TDXD. Uh, it, as I mentioned before, we saw this in cervical cancer, again, seeing a 50% response rate uh, in a very small treatment cohort. But again, we saw responses in patients who did not have high expression of, of HER2 on their surface, but again, deep responses. So we're really super excited to see this uh, particular um, therapy go forward. And as mentioned, just like we saw with endometrial cancer, this is now listed in the most recent NCCN guidelines as available therapy. So just in cervix cancer, we have all of these things going forward. Again, as a, like endometrial cancer, this was a disease that had very low interest from pharma, now changing the landscape, changing the world. So fortunately, these have all come from very, very carefully conducted clinical trials that many of you maybe have participated in. But as, as, as Godfrey mentioned, this is how we make, how we move the needle. And we have in all three of these diseases, we really have robustly changed the natural history because of the investigative environment is so active, uh, we have really been able to do this at, a real, at an unprecedented pace. And I mean that truly because in the first 20 years of my career, we saw almost no activity um, in, 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 and change in the standard of care, went through a very long dry spell, but now we're seeing these changes coming ever so rapidly. So thank you for all who have participated. And for those of you considering it, please, please ask about whether or not you qualify for a trial. And with that, I'll close, Danielle. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Coleman, for having shown us last findings from clinical trials worldwide and a lot of hopes for the future. Thank you. Always great presentation. Sure. So now we will now open the floor to questions in the same way before, or raising your hand or submit your question in the chat. Meanwhile, I would to ask to um, Robert Coleman, how do you think about the pharma companies? Could help the patients to involve them into trials, for example, with webinar, educational programs, or scientific society like IGCS? Yeah, it's a really important question. Um, and I think there's a couple of ways. So you mentioned several um, opportunities for increasing awareness. I think that does, that helps, um, uh, at least lets helps people, on, lets patients understand and, their, and healthcare givers understand what's available to, the, to them out there. The clinical trials, uh, I think the most frustrating thing that I hear from patients about uh, clinical trials is that the selection criteria doesn't apply to them. So they say, oh, you know, I've got that disease. You know, it sounds like that's a good drug for me. And they go in and they find out that they're ineligible. So one of the other characteristics, and, and, for, and fortunately, we do have the, uh, the FDA behind us on this, is that we're trying to make these trials more inclusive to apply to, 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 apply to a broader audience of patients that don't necessarily fit the very strict criteria for a very large phase three trial. Now, this is a little bit of a double-edged sword because pharma companies want to make sure that the patient populations that they're studying are homogeneous enough that we can pick out that it was the intervention that made the difference and not some other characteristic. And that's why we do randomized trials as opposed to just giving everybody the drug and seeing what happens based on historical controls. But I do think there's opportunities such as um, prior history of breast cancer, you know, which seems to exclude many, many patients um, or, um, uh, or the duration of time from the previous therapy or get a little bit more inclusive. Um, or allowing for more, uh, more prior treatments. And I think that this is where the patient voice is really super important in, 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 in saying that, listen, 
we want these trials to be applicable to a bigger patient population because it makes so much difference. Um, and there's, and it's, and again, it's not, you know, some of our participation in clinical trials is not because, you know, the patients are worried about the experimental, they're worried about not being asked. And, uh, and so we really need to do that. And, and uh, the more that we can get patients involved at the table, uh, the more uh, that we have success here. So thanks to all the patient advocates out there who have really worked on this particular um, uh, effort. Thank you, Rob. And our friend, Michel Collins, asked to you, just curious of the role of intraperitoneal chemo for ovarian cancer. It was the gold standard in 2015 when I was diagnosed and I did receive it. All this is plugging intraperitoneal since I had allergic reaction uh, to Taxol. Still in remission eight years later, but don't think it's really recommended anymore. Well, it, it's, it's an option. I wouldn't say it's um, not recommended. Um, it is an option. I think what happened is that around that time in 1985, um, when these were starting to emerge as a series of phase three trials, each of the trials um, had some issues uh, that uh, made it difficult to interpret. So they weren't, the three that kind of really solidified IP therapy were actually very different trials. Like the very first of those trials didn't include the drug paclitaxel, which we wouldn't even think about today. I mean, this is kind of our staple of background. The second one actually included um, more, more exposure to chemotherapy, it, uh, including an, an induction of a very high level of chemotherapy for two cycles before the randomization or before the uh, institution of IP therapy. And the third one had a different schedule um, than we had um, actually investigated previously and nobody could give it. So they basically, because of the toxicity, changed the schedule changed the dose and expected to have the same outcome. So, so we, 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 we were struggling with that, but then came along bevacizumab. And we started to see that bevacizumab added to regularly administered chemotherapy could also induce a big change in, in the prevention of progression. So we decided to put them all together in one trial called GOG-252. It was IV chemotherapy with bevacizumab it was I and two, uh, and two, um, uh, and, and, and also a dose dense strategy and also an intraperitoneal. And all three curves of that particular strategy overlapped. And I think that that's what made people say, well, um, at least in the general population using bevacizumab, we really don't see a major difference in the outcomes of, uh, of the use of intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Now, having said that, we did that in a setting where we really didn't understand the molecular characteristics of the tumor. So we're kind of going back to it again, because we think that intraperitoneal chemotherapy may be exquisitely sensitive in patients' tumors, patients whose tumors carry a BRCA mutation. And so we're still kind of not really sure, but part of the HOT trial, which is an intraperitoneal chemotherapy that's given intraoperatively, is actually looking at that question in the context of, uh, of a PERP inhibitor also stratifying by this molecular signature. So it's not completely gone. It is an option and there are many places that still use it, but this is kind of the drama that led to the reduction in, in that recommendation. Thank you. And another one is by Deborah. I believe that more collaboration between scientists and survivors is important in moving the needle forward for early diagnosis and more effective treatment for ovarian cancer. How can we make this happen? <laughs> it's very yeah, difficult. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a, great, it's, a great, it's a great question, but it really, it comes to being a patient advocate. You know, um, most, since we don't have a, um, an early uh, diagnosis or screening strategy that's been shown to be effective in the general population for ovarian cancer, um, most of these um, uh, programs that are under investigation are investigational. So they are being studied and all of these are supported by grants that require a patient voice. And so I've been very, very fortunate to work with many patient advocates on many grants over the years. And that is absolutely how this works. Um, these patient advocates provide really key insight into uh, not only the science behind these, behind these particular programs, but also the acceptability 
because a screening early diagnosis program has to be acceptable. You know, uh, it has to be something that people, people will go back and do not just once, but repetitively like a pap smear. So, um, so really I, I completely agree. I wouldn't limit it to the early diagnosis. I would also say that they need to be involved in all of our late stage development too, because there are just certain programs that are just infeasible. I mean, it sounds like a good idea on paper, but they're just infeasible. And we really need our patient advocates to help push that narrative. Okay, and the last one is by Shakeya. Thank you, Shakeya. Um, do you suggest that patients ask their medical team what trials they qualify for? As a patient's advocate, I find it difficult to find the, the information regarding available trials. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, 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 I would say for sure. At every treatment decision, you know, one of the real misconceptions about clinical trials is that people say, well, I'm not sick enough or I'm not far enough along in my, in my journey to consider a clinical trial. That's absolutely the wrong way to look at it. <laughs> I hate to say it absolute, but it really is. It should be flipped the other way around. Is that earlier when you're healthy, and you've got an opportunity to get exposure to a new drug is the best opportunity to participate in a clinical trial. And really, it is hard. It's complicated. You, you go to a website and it lists, you know, eligibility criteria that's, you know, 20 points long. It's very hard to synthesize that, but it's absolutely appropriate to ask your healthcare team of whether or not you're eligible for a trial at every treatment decision change. At diagnosis, first therapy, at maintenance treatment, at recurrence, at re recurrence treatment, at recurrence maintenance, at recurrence surgery, every decision point. This is what I do. Every decision point, I think about whether or not you're eligible because that's, that's going to be the best. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. And thank you all for your questions. Unfortunately, the time goes away almost <laughs> too quickly. So do you need to take a short break or you prefer to move on from the audience? You know, I think if anyone wants a break, Daniela, maybe they're free to do so. We'll let Debbie and Genevieve get set up. Rob, thank you so much as always. You bet. Gottfried, thank you both. Thank you. We are yeah, thank entering you. the next phase of the program. So everyone feel free to take a little break. I think maybe in just one or two minutes we'll resume and you can certainly join at any time. And we'll get Debbie and Genevieve set up. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in a little bit. Hi, everyone. Are we taking a break? I think we're going to do like a couple minutes just to get everybody a chance to reshuffle. Um, we just finished up with Rob and Godfrey. So thank you. And Genevieve, nice to see you. Thank you for joining. Uh, Mary, thank you. Daniela, thank you, Rob. I, I have to dial off now, okay? Yes, thank absolutely. You. Thanks, Godfrey. Thank, thank you very much. Guys. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Great Thank job. you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Uh -huh. Bye bye. Bye bye. So maybe in just one more minute, we'll get started with the next phase of our program, which I think is very exciting. We've got a couple of introducing a couple of new topics. I know uh, Genevieve, you didn't have the pleasure of meeting Dicey, but she really was just a true champion in this space and would embrace every bit of what you're going to share with us. So it's so nice to have you here and to feel that spirit and, and feel as if Dicey is really present with us through what you and Debbie are going to do for us today. Thank you, that's wonderful. And I, Debbie has shared a lot about Dicey and how important her work was and how it really yeah. impacted um, the organization as a whole. Definitely. So I'm honored to be here to bring some of that um, energy and creativity in because um, I really do believe it. it is a healing force. I know, I agree. And I'm so, so grateful to Debbie for embracing these concepts. And really, she researches things. She believes in things that are important for our patients and caregiver community. So thank you to you too, Debbie. So I think we should get started. I think people, if they're still on break, they'll come back. But I think this is such a great, um, exciting part of the program that I want to get started. Sounds great. Um, all right, so I, I'm Genevieve Sines, for those of you who are here, hi. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist with a private practice in Austin, Texas. I'm also um, 
for the past eight years, I have worked at Hospice Austin, uh, working in grief and loss and as a creative uh, teacher and educator there. So a lot of my practice is about how to work with uh, physical and emotional healing from a creative lens. And that's what we're going to uh, talk about today is how hopefully some of these ideas will go through a lot of different ideas and hopefully you'll leave inspired um, and unafraid and feeling brave and ready to do some creative work. And Debbie is going to help me. Uh, Debbie, are you there? Yes. Hi. So Debbie is going to help me move through some slides here. So we'll start off with this very basic question that some of you may have already contemplated, but maybe this is the first time you're asking yourself, how can creativity help me heal? So there is actually quite a bit of research, um, not enough in my opinion, but quite a bit of research done from a psychological perspective and a uh, physical healing perspective on the integration of using particularly visual arts in uh, cancer patients treatment. So for example, this pilot study from 2020 um, that showed a marked reduction in emotional distress, depression, anxiety, and pain in cancer patients when they were using visual art therapy at all times of their treatment. So there is a lot of evidence that creativity um, can aid you in your journey and your healing process, but also we sort of talk about, well, how? How does it actually help you? How can it actually help you? And so I'm bringing forward these four ways, and these are just four, there's probably others, but these four ways that creativity could be of use for people who are in a cancer healing process. The first being relaxation. So we can understand how when you're uh, going through treatment, it's really hard to not be anxious and to feel overwhelmed. And definitely just having a creative outlet can be incredibly relaxing and bring a lot of peace and just sort of whew, deep breaths to the process. The other way that creativity can be helpful is expression. So often um, in the experiences you've been talking about today, the patient doesn't get a lot of chance to say how they feel or what they're going through or what their experience is like from the inside. And so just having a place where you can express and clearly state this is how this experience feels for me, um, can be healing in and of itself. The third way is insight. So doing art, and we're talking about visual art, but we're also talking about all different types of creativity. So we're broadening it to writing and uh, poetry, to music, maybe even movement. And so thinking about how art can bring us great insight. It can help us realize something that maybe we don't quite have in our consciousness yet. We write something about it and we go, oh, look, that's actually how I feel about that. Or this is why that was so intense for me. Seeing something outside of ourselves can help us see it a little clearly, a little bit more clearly. And then the final way that we're gonna talk about today is creativity can really help with empowerment and connection. So this means, the, um, the way that in the process of healing, sometimes we can move into very inadvertently a, a place of feeling like a victim. We can feel like the world is against us. We have terrible luck. Nothing, nothing good could happen to us and no one is listening. Right? And this is a really rough place to be stuck in. The the thing about being creative is when you're being creative, you are stepping into a power, a certain sense of agency, a certain sense of being able to express, a certain sense of being able to uh, move from the outside in. And it moves you right out of that victim mentality. It moves you right out of feeling like the world is against you because you can kind of, in some ways, fight back and say, well, you know what? I may have everything going wrong my way, but I'm gonna plant a garden. Incredibly empowering to, to, to do what you can do, to have those close in steps in the healing process where, you know, I can't necessarily go for a walk today, but can I listen to music and move my hand a little? These little steps of empowerment are what kind of shift and move us into a place of 
embracing our own power to heal. Um, and related to that connection, so we're going to be talking a little bit more about the difference between process art and product art or process creativity and product creativity. Some things we make just for the sake of making them and some things we make for the, for the desire to send them out in the world and have them be seen. And sometimes it's both, right? Sometimes it's both we're making it for the sake of making it and then having it be seen feels really good. So connection is an important, a really important thing that creativity can bring us. Okay, so here's the first question where I would love it if you would jump into the um, chat and Debbie's gonna have her eye on that, right Debbie? And um, share a little bit about what is stopping you. So let's just go with the fact that you believe me that creativity can be helpful. <laughs> what is stopping you from doing it right now? Um, well, Debbie, if, if any pop in, would you read them to me? Sure. Thanks. And so resistance is a really normal part of any art making or creative experience. And here are some, just a few of the things that might be stopping you. And I'm really curious to hear what actually, what is in the way. The first thing is what I like to call the inner critic. So the inner critic is usually this small part of us, sometimes it's large, this voice in our head that comes forward and says, uh-oh, you might fail. Uh-oh, you might get this wrong. Uh-oh, someone might see this and think it's bad. Usually around creativity or art making, this inner critic came in in some art class or music class at some point when you were a kid or someone saw something you did or heard you singing or saw you dancing and said, oh, right? And then this inner critic starts forming of like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get it wrong. Um, so that could be in the way. You could really have a lot of judgment. I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't make art. I'm no good. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be what I want it to be. These kind of things are the inner critic voice. And it can really get in the way even of professional artists is what I want to say. That's like writer's block, right? Another thing that can get in the way, and this is incredibly important when we're talking about oncology patients, I think, is the lack of time or resources. So there is so much involved in our day-to-day -day life it is sometimes really hard to justify needing to stop and write a poem. <laughs> it feels so luxurious. It can feel like, well, I have to go here and do this. And I have to talk to these people and I've got to call all these people, I've got to navigate all these systems. And so we sometimes feel like we're not equipped with what we need to be creative. Like we don't have the time or I will do that project when I can afford watercolors or I'll do that project when I can, uh, when I when I have the time or the money to go buy the resources I need. And I'm not dismissing any of these yet. <laughs> um, they're all valid, right? It really is true that we just have busy lives and sometimes we don't take the time or have the time to take a deep breath, much less engage in a creative process. Another thing that might be stopping um, some of you out there, and this one is very tender, is an experience of, of grief and loss that might come up when you think about doing something creative. Perhaps you were someone who used to make quilts and now your hands hurt and you can't make quilts the way you used to. I think giving yourself a lot of grace that that is an experience of loss and that is an experience of um, what it's like to be changing, your human body changing in the world. And it can be very, very painful. Sometimes just overwhelming grief and loss in general, maybe you've lost, and I'm not just talking about the loss of a loved one, I'm talking about the loss of ability, I'm talking about the loss of um, a change of life, and loss of, the loss of um, a community, things like that. This loss can really get in the way and it can be really difficult when you're in pain um, to think creatively because the pain kind of steps in and gets in the way. Yeah, Debbie, did you have something? Yep, we have a few comments. So Diane Crawford, anyone who wants to turn on their camera, you're welcome to. Diane Crawford says, I like drawing, but sometimes you can't tell what I draw, <laughs> LOL. <laughs> I love working in my yard and think that's where I can be most hands-on creative. 
Anxiety in trying to organize all that I have to do or want to do does hold me back at times. Anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. I totally hear that. The anxiety of how to make time for it. And then the, it sounds like there's a lot in that one. Like the inner critic is in there. If I don't know what I draw, <laughs> good. and the, um, and, and I love the idea of gardening or cooking. And thank you for bringing that up because we are not just talking about painting. When we talk about creativity, I should have started there. We are talking about anything that takes the elements that are around you and makes them into something else. So that could be decorating your house. That could be gardening. Um, I love the quote. I can't remember who said it, but it's garden, garden like you will live forever. Right. There's such a, there's such a hope in gardening. There's such a future orientation. Um, cooking for your family can be a creative act. Getting dressed in the morning, putting on makeup can be a creative act. It's just anything where you are creating meaning and beauty in your life. You're taking what's in front of you and organizing it in a beautiful way. That is the creative energy. And that is why it's so healing is because I believe, and I think a lot of people would agree with me, that creativity is in itself a healing process. It's a, a moving of elements into an alignment. Um, we yeah. have another comment. Uh, Maria, <laughs> uh, sorry, I might say your name wrong, Papa Giorgio. Uh, I'm professional. I am a professional artist, a painter. And since my diagnosis, I haven't really painted. Mm -hmm. I might start something, but I haven't really painted. I might do other things or might even help others paint and express themselves, but not regularly. Yeah, I think that one, and I, I hate to just label it, but I think that one really points to this grief and loss to the uh, that it's sometimes really hard. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, please, but that that it's sometimes just very difficult, especially I think for people who've been professional artists or professional creative types to find that energy again and to step into that, what I call libidinal energy or that creative energy. Um, and maybe even to step in from different directions is really, really difficult. So it's okay, I think, to honor when you've been a painter your whole life. It's okay to not paint when you're in a process like maybe there's a different need like as you're naming for other people or maybe there's a different way that energy can express okay so this is the next question and thank you for those of you who are commenting that's really um, a tender gift so this question and you're feel free to go ahead and comment as well in the chat how can I help myself be brave one thing about all that resistance that we need to understand is that it's important. The resistance is important. We can't just push through it and ignore it. So it is very important to be gentle with yourself and to go at whatever pace you need to go. If you push yourself through a creative process, um, I, I frankly don't think it'll be quite as effective. So you can start with what you know. You can take really small steps. Like I said, putting on your makeup in the morning. How can that be? a simple creative act? How can you bring the energy of creating beauty into your day-to-day, -day, into your coffee making, right? Into your morning beverage. How can you make art with your morning beverage? <laughs> it can be that small. It can be very, very small. And it's okay to start with what you know. It's okay to say, okay, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable drawing, but I feel comfortable in the garden. Just using that example, you know, and I feel comfortable getting out there in the dirt. This is what I know. You don't have to push yourself too hard is what I'm saying there. Um, also paying attention, we're gonna go back to that idea of process and product. Frankly, I kind of believe they're actually the same thing, but I won't get all into that. Um, but just paying attention more to how it feels to make something than to how it will feel for that thing to be seen. How does it feel to make something? How does it feel to create? That's where we're at. We don't really want to get lost in who's going to see this. Is this going to end up being beautiful? How's this going to go? You're making for yourself. My grandmother was an artist and she, um, I once asked her, do you make art for yourself or do you make it for the people who buy it? And she said, oh, you always make it for yourself or else no one will buy it. <laughs> and I love that answer. I think it's true. I think you have to always be creating from a really 
a place of not how is this going to be received, but how is it helping me? What is it saying about me? What, what am I, where am I in this process? Um, helps you enjoy the process a lot more too. And then also connecting with others. So this is, you know, it can help us be brave when we reach out and say, hey, would you like to all join a, a pottery class together, right? It can help us be brave when we connect with others or experiences that invite us more actively to be creative. If you have friends who are just naturally walking through the world as really highly creative people, I'm sure you can think of some. All of you probably have at least a few. Maybe you are one of those people. Um, gather those people in, <laughs> you know, draw their energy in and say, can we make something together or alongside each other? Can we parallel create? Um, or yes, if you really want to be called to, to use your creativity, how can you join a class? Something online, something simple. Um, and, you know, even if it's a skill that you're not even necessarily super interested in learning, just getting out there and like playing with a new skill can be really a great way to be brave and show up for yourself. Um, and then asking your resistance, this is more towards the inner critic thing. If you have a lot of inner critic going on, I can't do this, I can't dance, everyone will laugh when I, when I, they see this, that kind of stuff. I like to say that maybe you can send that inner critic on a, on a, a coffee break. <laughs> Just say, hey, I, I understand that you're trying to keep me safe from failure, but can you take a break? And I'm going to practice being brave. Um, art making requires brave, bravery and bravery requires vulnerability. So it is inherently a vulnerable process. Um, and so asking that part of us that says, this is dangerous, this is dangerous, don't do it, to just take a break and say, hey, just for this time, I'm going to practice being brave. And Debbie, that brings me, yes, thank you. Um, so this is my main idea for how to be creative that I'd like to give you. Um, creative rituals. So before we go to this, was there a comment, Debbie, that came up? Uh, oh, yes. Um, Michelle Collins. After my diagnosis, I got into coloring with colored pencils. Mm. I have to get back into that. It's been a while since I've done that. It's funny you mentioned applying makeup, she says. I've been watching TikToks to better my makeup technique, and I forgot how much I enjoyed blending colors. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for bringing in enjoyment. Yes, this is about pleasure, and it is about connecting with parts of yourself that feel playful and joyful. So I'm so glad to hear that um, that idea being brought in that like, what do you enjoy? That's sort of that start with what you're comfortable with, right? Like, what do you enjoy? Thank you. I just wanted to check in on that comment. So back to this idea of ritual. So ritual simply defined is a repetitive action done with intention. I like to use the example of brushing teeth. Uh, most of us brush our teeth at least once a day, maybe at least once a week, right? We, we, we brush our teeth. It's, it's sort of a daily ritual that a lot of people have. But the difference between a habit, we might have the habit of brushing our teeth, and a ritual is when we bring intention and meaning making into that experience. So when we really say, I am going to feel every tooth as I brush it. I'm going to light a candle as I brush my teeth. I'm going to breathe, right? We're bringing a meaning to brushing our teeth. We're not just engaging in a daily habit. So I just use that as an example of a way that anything can become a ritual, anything we do. We, it's just about the intention we put on something. So a ritual, and the reason I really highly recommend creative rituals in, in a healing process, in an oncology process, is because rituals can put a frame around the time you spend creating. So you can say, for example, and this is just one example, you can find your own way here, but that for 30 minutes every Wednesday at 1.30, I am going to sit down and write. Okay, good news about that. You don't have to write any other time of the week. <laughs> you can only write during that time, right? Or you could write at other times, but it's taken care of, that box is checked. 
And it puts this time frame around it. When your inner critic comes up, you can say, oh, I'm only writing for 30 minutes, inner critic, you can get out of here. Or when your grief and loss come up, you can say, hey, yeah, I've got to incorporate that into this 30 minutes, right? So it can really put a nice frame around creativity and that takes the pressure off. It also takes the pressure off of the product. If I'm engaged in a creative ritual where say I'm doing gardening one hour a week, right? And that's my creative ritual. Well, I'm not so engaged in how the garden's going to look when my friends come over next week and having to get it all right. Cause I know I'm going to be gardening again next week in an hour, right? So it sort of creates this, um, creates this pattern in your life that you can return to and um, means that you don't have to get it right that time. You might get it right the next week. It also helps track expression and insight over time. And Debbie has a really good example that I'd like actually to talk about here and um, bring in, because I think it's a good example, Debbie, of how you mm -hmm. tracked insight over time. And also all these things, really, your creative ritual, because it's you were creating that invitation to be creative for yourself. So go ahead, tell us about yes, that. Yes, I'd love to share. And and we have more chats and I'll, I'll talk about those at, on the next slide when we talk about ideas for creative expression. But I did want to uh, share this. Um, I'll stop sharing the screen really quick. Um, I had, um, oh, there's someone coming in. Um, Dicey Scroggins, I built a memory book for her last year. And I didn't realize at the time that I was doing something creative or creating a ritual for myself. Um, but it was something that I was doing after my day was over, all the stress of the day and working and trying to get the annual meeting going for our IGCS. At the end of the day, I would return to this memory book where I had printed out articles that she had written, that people had written about her, tweets that people had written, photographs of her. I bought inspirational sayings on stickers, just like things make to make this book because I really wanted to do something special for her. And I didn't realize at the time that I was actually doing something for myself as well. That in, in that creative process, I was learning and finding inspiration in this work, this patient advocacy work, because I'm in the communications for IGCS, but now I'm more transitioning into this work for patient advocacy. And that process of creating that book really helped me gain insights into this whole world here and and I mean it was amazing it was just amazing what happened and I felt like she was almost speaking to me through the book and it was it was just a beautiful ritual that is beautiful and I think that it really illustrates how we can begin a process a creative process and we're kind of diving into something and um who knows where we'll like what will come from those depths, right? We're, we're sort of like um, going in to look for treasure and you don't know what is going to come out when you're engaged in a creative ritual like that. Anything could come out or nothing, <laughs> right? right? But it is it is such a beauty to hear how how much you got from something, right? From, from really the investment paid off. Um, and I think that you're not alone. I think that that is generally how it goes when we engage in a creative process. So... Please share your ideas in the chat or your stories of ways that creativity has helped you. I would love to hear them. And also we're gonna go through some ideas. So if so, if any of these you know, are like, oh, I really wanna try that, go ahead and jot them down and, and keep a little note of like, I wanna try this, right? So even if you have your, your hand going right now as you're kind of generating ideas with us, we're gonna go through the different things that, pre, that um, creativity can bring you in a healing process. So the first one, relaxation. If we're looking for the art or the creativity to bring us relaxation, we might engage in something like doodling or scribbling, where we are just sort of letting our hand flow, going and doing what we want. Coloring is perfect. Someone mentioned coloring before because it is, um, you already have a pattern. Sometimes, especially with if your goal is relaxation, you don't want to have to generate too much. You just kind of want to go in the flow of what is and make small choices. And that can feel incredibly relaxing. If you are someone who already knows how to play an instrument, I think playing an instrument can also be very relaxing. Um, you know, be it guitar or drums, just sitting down and really letting the instrument hold your energy. Um, and then also, or be your voice. That's what I mean, right? Just let it be your voice. Needlework crafts. Um, if anyone crochets or um, 
does knitting or does embroidery, the repetitive nature, even working with your breath as you're doing some of those hook and turns and twists, that can be just such a beautiful relaxation, almost a meditation. So the, re the relaxation ones are a lot more like a meditation. They're a lot more like you can kind of move into a place of peace or even getting lost or watching your thoughts pass by as you do something or create something. It can be very, very beautiful. Um, the next thing is expression. So these are ones where you might just need to get something out. There's a feeling inside and you just need to get it outside of you. And so again, all of these ideas could kind of probably do all these things, but these, but if you want to express dance and movement, and I know that um, I want to talk a little bit here about being gentle with yourself. If you are a dancer or if you have a history of using movement as a way to process, because when your body is in a situation of being a patient's body, right? It can be very gentle or tender to notice the things that your body can't do that it used to be able to do. This is a place where you'll really feel your, um, the change, right? You feel the transformation you're in. And so being really gentle with yourself, if you use dancing or movement or even sculpting, but if you use dancing or movement or something more physical in your creativity, even gardening, right? Noticing Jacqueline, that. Jacqueline said swimming for me and rug uh, Swimming is definitely movement. Yeah. And move that movement, right? So that's a good one of noticing that it, th things might be changing. So just being gentle with yourself around that. Um, also expression. I feel like visual arts, painting, drawing is really great for expression. Um, sculpting is really powerful, can be really embodied. You can hit on a lot of different um, sort of, uh, I want to say primal stuff when you're sculpting or dancing or moving, really get stuff out, really express emotion. Moving to insight ideas, um, writing letters, poems, and journaling. One of my favorite prompts is writing letters to yourself in the past and writing letters from the past self back to you and same for the future, writing letters to your future self and letters. So, so letters through time. Um, or writing letters that you won't send is can be really, really therapeutic. Um, are there people who either have passed on or people who you can't for some reason communicate with? Sometimes just sitting down and drafting a letter to them can feel incredibly healing, like they've been heard. And it gets a lot out. And it creates a lot of insight. Poetry, journaling. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing all these wonderful ideas. I kind of want yeah. to stop. And I think them. we're yeah. coming. Yeah, I think we're coming to the end of this segment. So let me just read through these, and we'll share these Great. slides after the fact. You all can review them. Um, so let me just go through these really quickly here. Uh, Shakia Allen, I found my healing in making uterine cancer awareness bracelets. It gives me time mm -hmm. just to think as I make them. I know I've seen those bracelets on your Twitter account. I, I'm, I think I have. So that's really great. Um, Karen uh, Nakawala, I decided to change my entire wardrobe after my treatment. I designed everything and I hired a tailor to help me put the ideas together. It's so therapeutic. I added crocheting to that, which I do with my 13 year old daughter now. So there's connection. Yeah. Uh, and expression. Then yeah. Uh, rug hooking, Jacqueline also said, then uh, Jacqueline said, Dicey's my advocate hero, which I think we all wow. agree. Uh, Deborah Binder, I created a storytelling video during a workshop with other cancer survivors. My piece is about genetic testing. It's a powerful creative process. Mm -hmm. And she added the link. I have to agree with that. We've been doing some videos too. It is a very powerful storytelling is mm -hmm. a great form. Um, Maria, Papa Giorgio again, uh, narrative medicine is good a good advice. There are free sessions from Columbia University. Cool. Um, and then Millicent, uh, dancing, it's for me and making carpets with other survivors have been of help. And we'll hear, watch a video from Millicent later. She did share her experiences with us. 
Uh, Michelle Collins got into making beaded friendship bracelets with my daughter to trade with fans at the Taylor Swift concert this summer. <laughs> I really got into it and found it relaxing. And then finally, Corby Arthur. I do artistic swimming. Oh, that sounds really great. And also swim. I find that when I'm physically unable to do that, I'm in treatment. I can go to the pool to help coach and also mindful meditation about swimming and artistic swimming. I even write a routine to music on land. I am so touched by these. You know, y'all are making my point way better than I could ever make it, which is that you're already doing this. There's no way I think to be a patient or, or even a patient advocate and not engaged in some kind of creative process. Creativity is everywhere. It's just a lens we put on the things we do. So it's amazing that it's naturally happening. It happens naturally. We know, like there's some part of us that knows that in order to shift things, I have to make, I have to do, I have to move. And um, so that's the whole point. Yeah, it's just not letting those things get in the way that stop us and instead moving, moving into our power and our connection. Yeah. Thank you, Genevieve, for joining wow. us. Oh, it's so amazing, Genevieve. Jenna or Debbie has spoken so highly of you, but I feel like I got to get creative now. I'm going to challenge myself yeah. this week to do something creative, a little outside of my comfort zone as well. So thank you so much. Daniela, were you inspired? That's amazing, amazing presentation. Thank you, Genevieve. V very amazing. Thank you. It was an honor to be here. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to stay around and listen to the, yes. to the next thing that Debbie's leading because I'm very excited about it. Great. This. Okay. Well, Debbie's got some, we mentioned, I think in the beginning, something new that we're going to kick off this fall. And so we thought we would give you a little teaser of this. We don't know a lot of the details yet. We're still working through those once we get through September and Awareness Month and our summit. But Debbie has some great ideas. I think this really, actually, Debbie, kind of flows very naturally into this next um, concept of lived experience. I think oh, it definitely. takes a little bit of creativity to tell your story. And um, hopefully there's great benefit, like when doing creative things and telling everyone's um, lived experience through your journeys, whether you're a patient or a caregiver, an advocate. So I'm going to let Debbie tell us a little bit more about that. It's super exciting, Debbie. Thank you for all your hard work in this. Sure. Okay. I'm going to share my screen again. And there's some videos embedded in this, so bear with me. Um, so yeah, we've Mary and I have been working on a new project um, and we are still kind of working on the details of how to, what to call it, how to brand it, all that marketing stuff that sort of comes together a little bit um, in pieces. But when Mary first proposed that uh, IGCS get into the patient advocacy space, one of the goals she had set forth with Dr. Quinn, um, Michael Quinn at the time, the president, was um, to work towards empowering patients and survivors to better advocate for themselves and others in their community. Um, she knew that IGCS being an international society meant that our patient engagement and outreach programs would need to be unique uh, and, and maybe shifting and changing and because there's everything international, there's so many differences all over the world. So I've had a chance now to get more involved in this area and I'm very excited to see where it can take us. Um, this has been something I think I can really sink my teeth into. I have a background in theater, so storytelling is right on that same vein of directing, you know, making these videos. So it's just really great for me. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, play a quick introduction video to this new concept. It's only two minutes. And um, chat me or text me, Ashley, if my sound is too loud. So here we go. Oh, let me do, I think I need to share this one too. Let me do share sound. The lived experiences of cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers are a valuable and important form of expertise that can be applied to improve health outcomes and drive social change. Through their day-to-day -day interactions, feelings, and experiences, People living with cancer truly understand the gaps and challenges that need to be addressed in a way that others cannot. Simply put, 
A lived experience refers to the first-hand involvement or direct experiences and choices of an individual and the knowledge they gained from that experience, opposed to knowledge gained from a second-hand or mediated source. Learning about the experiences of those directly affected by a cancer diagnosis helps us gain a deeper understanding of the realities they face. The lived experiences of a patient's family members, friends, and caregivers are also incredibly valuable. They develop insights into complex issues and seek solutions for the health, comfort, and dignity of those in their care. Their stories, opinions, and ideas need to be heard. IGCS and the International Gynecologic Cancer Advocacy Network is calling on those with first-hand knowledge of living with or caring for someone with a gynecologic cancer diagnosis to reflect on their lived experiences and the things they learned along the way. If this describes you, we want to hear your story and work with you to create a narrative that calls others to action. What issues do you care about the most? What do you want to ask others to do? When your voices are heard and views understood, you have the power to inspire and accelerate action to address inequities, stigmas, power imbalances, and discrimination. This is patient advocacy. Well, that was awesome. The lived experiences of okay so um so yeah so we've produced this video to sort of introduce you to the concept so in my research what do stories do let me just quickly tell you a little bit and then i'll play you a few examples so oh and in the meantime we'll walk you through this at the end so if you want to grab a pen and paper for in about 15 minutes i might ask you to write a few things down or uh, open up something on your computer to type um, so what do stories do stories tell you who you are they share moments that made you who you are and clarified your values. They tell who we are, share values of a group. What do we have in common? Stories teach a lesson. They share how you learn something through success or failure. Stories can motivate change, create dissatisfaction with the present, share mistakes, make a case for change, create a vision for the future. And stories also can change the frame. They allow the audience to see a problem through a different lens by changing the emotional climate. Stories can move us to act. So in many things we have, we have barriers to action and then catalysts that make us act, right? A lot of times we'll, we'll stop doing things and then we'll be like, oh, some, suddenly we have our motivation. So if we hear a story, um, we might you know, take that inertia of like, oh no, everything's just going this one way, but then we have an urgency to change it. They take you from fear to hope. It can take you from apathy to anger, which can make you do action. They can take you from self-doubt to feeling like you can make a difference. And stories can take you from isolation to feelings of solidarity by hearing other people's stories. So we're gonna use something called the public narrative framework. And this was developed by professor, professor Marshall Lewis Gantz, and it delivers a message in three parts. So this is gonna help us frame our storytelling um, in a way that gives you just a guidance. So we'll go through these again later, but it's the story of self, the story of us, and then the story of now. So the story of self, you begin with telling people what draws you to this work? What challenges have you faced? What decisions have you made? How do you feel? Just tell them about your personal story. Then you reflect on the story of us. So what might draw other people to this very same work that you're interested in? What are your shared interests and experiences? And who do you want to connect with through this story? And then the story of now, what is urgent and important for us to act on? Why now? What will you commit to doing differently from this time forward? And what would you ask others to commit to doing? So now we've prepared three stories. And I'm just gonna go ahead and play them. Um, Bar Levy in Israel, Millicent Kaganga in Kenya, and Frank Gambino in the USA. Frank is a caretaker. Um, the other two, um, well, you'll, I won't tell their stories. Let, let me do the, let me do it for them. So let's go. I was amazed with the results. And we discovered that my mother and I, we were not the only ones who did not know. 
And out there, there are so many women who still do not know. My name is Bar Levy. I'm from Tel Aviv, Israel. I'm the daughter of Sarit Rosenberg Levy, who passed away so young from uterine cancer. But I'm here to tell you my story. And it starts while I was sitting on the hospital's floor next to my mother's bed. It was 3 a.m. and she was finally asleep. She had been in the hospital for 33 days. 33 days since I've seen my wife or slept in my own bed. I was so worried, but not just because I felt like I was in the middle of military operation, it was because I finally understood the articles I was reading. You guys who watch this video right now, you must understand. I'm not a doctor and I do not have a medical or paramedical education. I'm just a lawyer. In Israel, we speak Hebrew. And the uterine cancer information available in Hebrew does not exist. So I decided I would read in English too. And you know what? The information written in English was not enough too. So I started to look for scientific information in English medical journals. It was 3 a.m. on day 33 of my mother's hospitalization. Sitting there on the floor with the articles, I understood that we would have a very long war against this cancer. That's what I had read about stage 4 uterine cancer. And my mom, she was a fighter. And I was sure that we would eventually win this war and conquer cancer. I hoped so badly. But nine months later, I learned how short the battle was. I was so angry with myself. Not because we did not conquer cancer, but because her diagnosis was so late. She had suffered with abnormal vaginal bleeding for two years. Why didn't I understand that it was a sign for cancer? Why didn't we know? During her chemotherapy, we dreamt together about founding an association. We wanted to support and provide resources for other patients, translating the latest data and information to Hebrew, so others won't have to explore so much as I did. We wanted to make sure that no women will lose their life because she was not aware of the symptoms of gynecological cancers. Fast forward 18 months later, I had seen it through. The dream of my mother and I shared. I founded Abayit Shubar Israel Women's Cancer Association one month after my mother passed away. I now manage a team of five personnel, and I'm so proud. We did something unique in just a year and honored the month of June as the first uterine cancer awareness month in Israel. When I heard the IGCS had the same idea in 2023, I knew we were on the right path. Now our association is well established and we have a very good practice of exploring and investigating our projects. We decided that we needed data, so we launched a survey to assess the current knowledge and awareness of Israeli healthy women regarding uterine cancer. I was amazed with the results, and we discovered that my mother and I were not the only ones who did not know. And out there, there are so many women who still do not know. And for the first time in 18 months, I could breathe again. I stopped feeling responsible for my mother's death. We discovered that three out of four women are completely unaware of uterine cancer. They had never heard about it. We understand that we have so much work to do in raising awareness and supporting patients. We understand that we can impact lives because earlier diagnosis means better prognosis. I urge you to spread the word. Help us save lives. Be aware of symptoms like abnormal vaginal bleeding and pelvic pain, and educate those you love, like your mother and sister. Be an educate for yourself and other women. Women can be cured from uterine cancer. Can I ask you for something? My story, my mother's story, should not be yours. Don't let it be yours. Right. And I, I was know, amazed with the results and we discovered sorry I'll get it right next time and I know Bar's on the call right now thank you so much Bar it was uh, great working with you amazing it's amazing thank you all <laughs>
Okay, this is Millicent from Kenya. I think she's on the call too. I think so. She was earlier. She's not. The number one enemy is stigma. Why? Because I almost killed myself. And also, I've seen people killing themselves because of the stigma. The stigma started with me, myself, when I'm going through the treatment and mostly with the, the community. My name is Millicent Kagonga. I live in Kenya, in Nairobi City. I, I was 25 years old when I found out I had stage four cervical cancer. Before I was diagnosed, I suffered for five years with abnormal vaginal bleeding and discharge. I didn't know what was wrong with me. Living in the slums of Kenya, the people in my community are very poor and are not educated about the, disease like, the diseases like cancer. There is a stigma associated with diseases that people are ashamed to talk about it. Many people think sickness is cast or witchcraft uh, or sins that needed to be forgiven. I could not afford sanitary towels and had to use rugs and my t-shirt. I tried to keep it a secret, but it was hard, especially because I shared common bathroom with neighbors. My marriage ended because my partner did not understand. I had three, three children. My family was starving and suffering from neglect. My second born child died. She was only four years old. It was very traumatic time for me. I was lucky to find an employer that allowed me to live with her. She gave me the love I so desperately needed, but I had to leave my children in the village to go to school and rely on the kindness of the teachers and others. Finally, I felt brave enough to tell my employer about my condition. And I saw someone on television talking about the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer. I decided to go for screening at the first facility I was turned away. They said I was too young to have cancer at 25. The then WHO guideline are the recommended to screening women at the age of 35 and above. They did not realize my symptoms made me a priority for screening. So I went to another facility and insisted to be screened. I found out I had stage four cervical cancer. I was devastated. I thought about ending my life killing my children and then killing myself. I thought there was no hope left and I never wanted to leave my children struggling the way I struggled. But then I did find the hope, first in the kindness of my employer and then in the kindness from other patients. I decided to go for treatment and was sleeping in the hospital corridors with the other patients and we formed a small community to support each other with the travel and other basic needs. If I have this community, leave out my neighbors, leave out my families, because my families were talking very nasty things. So I said, I'm going to make sure I've given hope. I have given someone hope, even if it's just little. And from that process, I learned that not every patient that needs money in terms of going through the treatment. Some of the patients that just need a shoulder to lean on. Some of the patients just need someone to listen to. Some of the patients just need someone to cry with, whereby we are lacking those persons in our community. I told myself, I'm going to change that narrative. I, I started to form a vision and a purpose to help others the way I had been helped. I never want anyone to go through what I went through, not even my worst enemy. The stigma I went through was a nightmare. I'm no longer embarrassed and ashamed to speak about my body and my experience. I've learned that going through cancer is one thing, but now surviving is another thing. Being a survivor, and dealing with what comes after cancer, I feel is it my duty to help others so they have it better than I did. I started inviting patients to 
my one room home so many are women forced out of their marriage because of the stigma of cervical cancer together we do bid work thread work crochet work as we go through emotional healing we make and sell carpets to support our needs we started as three women and now we are about 400 cancer patients and survivors meeting at Karyobangi North Health Center. When they see me, a cancer survivor, speaking out and being joyful, they say, I am a symbol of hope to them. We are now officially registered as community-based organization called Symbol of Hope Warriors. We dedicated to improving the lives of people with cancer and reminding them that they are beautiful, precious, and loved. Know that you have the power to influence others and be a symbol of hope. Sometimes the changes are slow, but we have to keep going, not just for ourselves, but for those who come after us. I urge you, those of you listening to this, to help me achieve my vision. Please hear some of the things I have learned. We desperately need education and compassion in, my, in our communities. Speak up to end stigma and raise awareness of cancer symptoms. Get involved in peer-to-peer -peer support groups. Changes everything. Find one to join, and if there is not a group available to you, see if you can start talking to other patients and start small. Newly diagnosed patients get health insurance. It is worth it when you are going through cancer treatment. Get educated about prevention and go for regular screening. My daughter was the first one to be vaccinated against HPV in Kenya, and I'm proud to say that. Learn about the vaccine and have your children vaccinated. For women going through radiation, learn about after care needs. When a woman is having radiation for cervical cancer, there will be changes in the body. Remember that you are beautiful, you are precious, and you are loved. You are strong. Do not give up. Do not give up hope. The number one... Uh, after going through this for three and a half, four years already, and I always heard about a clinical trial. We had the opportunity to get in one, and I figured it'd be time to take advantage of it because we were basically at a standstill. I'm Frank Gambino, Joyce's husband. This is my wife, Joyce Gambino, and we've been together for 57 years, and we're ready to take on anything. My wife has uh, low-grade ovarian cancer, which is different than a lot of other cancers, where there's just a tumor, and you could go in there and take it out, and hopefully you're clean. And you're my caretaker. Oh, yeah, I get to do a lot of extra things now, being that if she's not feeling too well or whatever it is, like, uh, you know, washing clothes, washing dishes, uh, doing a lot of things, going to the store, all things I never used to do. But uh, it gives you a good feeling to know that you're doing it and you're helping your wife because she's going through a lot worse time than I'm going through. Well, I've had it for four and a half years. I was diagnosed with it in uh, on Valentine's Day, 2019. And I've had two surgeries since then. And I've had 18 chemo treatments. And now being on the clinical trial, it seems like it's helping where the chemo after a while was not doing much at all for it. Uh, basically the pill that she's on now and uh... It seems to be working. You know, we're not at the end yet, but it's moving in the right direction. So right now we got to got to stay with it.
Uh, it's very challenging because we're in Naples, Florida, and the clinical trial is up in Orlando. And a lot of times with road construction and everything else that's going on right now, it used to be a three and a half to four hour trip that turned into a five, five and a half hour trip. And uh, we going up there twice a month, every two weeks. And we just got to the point now with the way everything's working, uh, where we're going once a month for, you know, for one or two days, basically one or two days again. I go with her all the time because after 57 years of being together, I think it's my duty to do that. And if I'm a little inconvenienced or I can't go off on this day or that weekend or whatever the case may be, uh, it's a matter of priorities. And why should she drive all the way up there for four hours, four and a half hours and by herself? And I'm over here playing golf, not right. And because of the clinical trial and people that I'm familiar with that, that have the same problem, uh, it makes it a lot easier just to know that, number one, you're not alone, and there's a lot of other people that you're possibly helping by going through this. To me, it would be a, a big plus. If you have an opportunity to get in one, I'd say go ahead and do it because uh, we've came further now with the clinical trial than we did in the last three years, four years. Her cancer, when she took the latest scan, I think was down 55%. So that's a big, pl that's a big plus. We're not changing our mind or quitting yet. All the things that you go through with this trial, uh, and what you've learned from other people and who you could educate talking to other people and answering their questions of what you're going through, I think is a, a very big help because be otherwise the average person, you're just in the dark and think you're the only one there. And I think this is a big help and I have no problem talking to anybody about it. Some people want to hide it and don't talk about it, but let it out there, let people know and you're helping somebody else. I also think that more doctors should be involved in the clinical trials, administering the clinical trials. There could be more people getting on trials and, you know, hopefully finding a cure for the problem. I think that would be a benefit. And if this helps, the sky's the limit. Okay, uh, so those were our three examples. So now we have 15 minutes left in our program. Um, I'm going to go ahead and walk you through those three parts of the story. Uh, it was amazing working with those um, those individuals for these um, for these videos. I'll stop sharing for a moment. Um, uh, Millicent, thank you so much for all the calls with me. Same to Bar Levy, and I'm um, not sure if Frank's on the call, but it was just really great listening to all your stories and hearing how you think things could change um, and the the problems that we needed to address, you know, in the world. So I'm sure all of you on this call have similar stories and ideas that you would want to share. So I think it's a good time for you to start thinking about you know, what's your personal story and what communities are you connected to? And what are those, you know, types of changes that you might call on that community to do um, if you want to do something together? The, the community could be uh, small, you know, your family, if it's, you know, go get genetic tests, everybody in the family. It could be a bigger community, um, you know, of cancer patients in your area. It could be your nation, you know, it, it could be anything. It, there are no wrong answers here. Um, so I'm gonna share again and let's go ahead and get started with that. So the self us now, let's practice telling our stories. So the first part of the story 
is the story of self. So if you have your pen and paper, or if you want to open up a Word document, I'm going to time about three to four minutes. I think we have time to do, let's do three minutes. Um, but I'll, first I'll review the questions here. So the guiding questions are, who are you and what draws you to this work? Where do you come from? What was the challenge you faced? What was at risk for you considering that challenge? What was the critical choice you made at that time? How did you feel about your options, choices, and outcome? Where did you find courage or hope or not? And what compels you today? So I'm gonna go ahead and set a timer for three minutes. Just jot down anything that comes to mind. That's about three minutes, a little over. So, and I'm not going to make you all send in your stories. Don't worry. Um, but at the end, I might invite you to type in some phrases into the chat. Um, just little phrases. So uh, the next part of the narrative is the story of us. So here are a few guiding questions. And this time we'll take probably just two minutes. 
because this might not be as take you as long to tell the story of us than and to identify your us as it is to tell your personal story. So these are the guiding questions for the story of us. With whom do you share interests and values? Who do you want to connect with? What connects you? What experiences and motivating values do you share? Who do you want to invite to join you in action? Two minutes. Two minutes is up. The final piece of the story and one of the most important parts for patient advocacy, the story of now. This communicates the urgent challenge we are called upon to face. As you reflect on your experiences, what needs to change? What must we act on now? What is an actionable commitment we can make? What vision could be achieved if we act? So what would you like to see happen? What do you want that community to do? Do you want them to speak up? Do you want them to raise awareness? Do you want them to go for testing? It could be anything. Uh, this time I'll give you uh, another two minutes and then we'll regroup again.
I'm gonna end that a little early there. So um, I now invite you all to share if you would like to share just one phrase, one sentence. So look back on what you wrote. And I know we're a little few minutes over here. Um, so thanks for sticking with us, but um, look back on what you wrote, reflect on the words, statements, and phrases that might resonate with you or pop out of what you wrote. Is there any little phrases about, you know, your, your story of self, your story of us, or the actions of now? And then I invite you to type into the chat if there are any things that came up. And then I thought maybe we could do a, you know, like a little group poem at the end of this where we just sort of read those statements um, together. And as you're typing and picking out your words, let me just um, let you know our plans for the rest of the this project is to, um, to continue to tell these stories and narratives. So I invite anyone on this call uh, who has a story to tell or a narrative to craft to, to connect with me, to email me. And there are many different ways. You don't have to do a video. Um, that was just the best medium for this particular uh, summit because it's uh, a, a virtual webinar. But we can post things on our website. You can do a written essay or a blog with photographs of your journey, of your experiences, of your family, of your friends. Um, so written, a photo essay is a really great one. If you're a photographer and you take photos of every experience like I do <laughs> in your life, you could post lots of photos and little captions with that. You know, this is my story. This is who I'm connected with. This is what I wanna see happen. Um, you can tell the story orally. Um, we could uh, do a, a podcast production or we can do a video recording like we just did with uh, Millicent Barr and Frank. So um, with, with footage, if you collect uh, video footage um, and wanna submit that in too, we have a really great um, video editor, um, Elizabeth Robinson, that we've been working with for the past year or so from Thunderhead Media. And she's amazing at putting these pieces together, uh, adding the music, um, editing you know the little pieces in and out of the, of the um, oral telling to make it, to craft it and kind of make it nice. So yeah, we invite you all to join us. Mary, do you have anything you want to comment on this? Mm -hmm. Or anyone? I open this up to really anyone now. Thoughts, feelings, Hi, Debbie. We have some comments coming in the chat right now um, with people taking the time to reflect. I'm not sure if you want to read through any of these, but thank you everyone who is chatting um, and taking time to reflect on your story and lived experience. Yeah, so a lot of great words for the stories that we heard. Um, and then Dorothy had a question. Yes, we... Yes, we, we will help with your stories for sure. Um, that is part of what we are offering with this. So from Michelle, what compels me today is fighting for all the patients who haven't been as fortunate as me with my outcome so far. Story of now from Karen. If we act now, we can eliminate cervical cancer. And from Dorothy, Stay with your next hundred yards on each step and goal. You can do this. So, thank you. I'd love to hear more. Anyone who wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to have a call, one-on-one -on -one call to talk about your story, uh, to help you craft your narrative, um, of, to, to pick out the pieces that if you're not sure, like, what is my call to action? What What is my story here? We can talk and have a conversation about it. There's always something to pull out um, of that. So I look forward to working on these. Um, yes, I'll type in my email here, Debbie. You can also go to the IGCS website, igcs.org and go to the like staff page. I'm on there too. Um, 
story of me. Oh, here, let's go to Roberta. Uh, I do what I do because of my dear friend and mentor who died three years ago and always said, I have a voice for those who don't have a voice. You all have a voice, every single one of you. Um, Karen, sorry me, I realize that my voice is an important tool in the fight because a lived experience can help change mindsets. You got it. This is exactly what we're, what we're working on here. Your voice is all matter. Uh, Deborah already sent me a story and a video. Excellent. I can't wait to see it. Um, Diane, people need to choose the toughest route to advocacy. As a cervical cancer survivor, that means talking about sex and how cervical cancer is contracted and spread. It's not easy, but it is prevention. I totally agree. We need to talk about the things that make people uncomfortable. We need to get comfortable with the things that are uncomfortable. I mean, that's exactly right. Um, Shakia, I forfeited my chances of giving life to try to save my own. I made a vow that day. If I make made it through my pain, I would have purpose and I would make sure everyone was informed about uterine cancer. That's great. Uh, Deborah, I'm a 14 year ovarian cancer survivor. I feel compelled to speak out for those who are no longer on the planet and for those who are still on their journey. When advocates come together, we are a powerful voice. Yes, I love this. This is exactly what I think an advocacy summit needs to have is, is are these powerful stories, you all making a community, coming together, sharing, realizing the, the power that you have. So I want to hear every single one of your stories. And I think that's the goal for our new project is to, you know, work with us, with Debbie, to share your story that we can use that then to, to make change and to move things forward and, you know, to really have a purpose for all of you and your interest with us. I agree with Debbie. There's no better way to do this than by telling the stories and sharing them and using our social media networks, your own networks, um, to really tell the lived experience. I think it's just an amazing thing. I really do. Daniela, do you have any thoughts? Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> great, Debbie. So um, it's very powerful messages. So thank you all for your stories and thanks to share with us something for, from you. Very good public narratives. And now I think we, we close our summit, Mary. Yeah, is there anything else, Debbie, follow up? Ashley, anything? Thank you so much for Ashley for being our organizer and keeping us together. <laughs> so uh, yeah, someone mentioned, I hope there are opportunities to network after this. Yes, I completely agree. We actually did start a WhatsApp yeah. group not too Great. long ago. I don't know if many of you use WhatsApp, um, but it, that's a challenge, right? It's coming up with a way to communicate after after these things are over. So if WhatsApp is your choice, it works for you, um, we can send out the link to join the group in an email to all the participants here today. And uh, I would love to see a flourishing WhatsApp group where you're all connected to each other. And it's not just us talking to you. It's all of you talking to each other, empowering each other, saying, hey, I just went through this. This is how I feel. Uh, sharing, asking questions like, how do you, how I'm struggling? I don't know. This is a challenge I'm facing. How can we work together? What are you doing? All of these things. So, yes, WhatsApp group is coming. And then a thank you to our sponsors. Of course, we have to have this at the end here. So, yes, right. Debbie. So now, thank you all for all your nice comments about our teamwork and summit. So we really appreciate this. Mary and Debbie, thank you for ensuring the live experiences of patients and caregivers are being amplified. What a great project to empower network members to advocate for change. I am excited to see how this unfolds. I'm so grateful for Dr. Coleman and Dr. Conancy sharing their experience, important experience with us today. And it was so nice to have Genevieve talk with us about creative expression. I think we all have some good ideas now about how to increase our creative side 
and to take time for our mental health. Thanks to all of you who join us today from all over the world. We hope you learn a lot and leave here today feeling empowered, inspired, and more connected to the patient's advocacy community. This truly was a great day. It's such a powerful thing to come together with people of different backgrounds from all over the world who all share the same passion. I'm honored to have been part of today's summit and to chair the GCS Advocacy Committee. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Goodbye and have a great rest of your day and evening. Bye everyone, thank you. Ciao. Bye bye.